Welcome back. I'm Alfred Lamarant Weber, and it's an extraordinary uh, privilege to be here uh, today with author and um, researcher Timothy Cohen. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. How are you? Uh, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And uh, uh, Tim has so many facets to him, and he is unfolding yet another facet uh, in this program with us, and that is of a researcher of life on Mars and on other celestial bodies. So I'd like to ask you, Tim, how is it that, that you entered this uh, area along with the other areas of hermeneutics that you are active in? Yeah, so hermeneutics means uh, interpretation of scripture in this case, uh, but, but this area, I, I started my life as a non-Christian, lived my life as a non-Christian until I was in college uh, as a secular Jew, actually Israelite. My mother came out of Egypt along with that side of my family during the 1956 Suez Canal conflict as Jewish refugees. They'd been a really wealthy family over there and everything was confiscated by the Egyptian government. Uh, traveled through Italy and then they made their way here. My mother, uh, as a young teenager, attended George Washington High School when it was a brand new school in the United States here in Colorado. And I, decades later, ended up attending the same school, strangely, after having moved to various places around the country prior to that. Uh, so I started out in terms of fossils and dinosaurs, having a real interest in that as a child, like so many children do. And my father um, was a university professor and uh, into um, geography uh, and that whole arena, climatology. But he got me a little magnifying glass to look at fossils when I was, I don't know, five years old, perhaps, because I was interested in the topic. You know, and it's just no different really from so many children who are fascinated by dinosaurs. And then later in life, I got into IT. At the age of 12, I was considered a prodigy uh, nationally and by 16, a global prodigy in IT for my age. I was a research intern with um, Atari Microcomputers, uh, you know, when they still existed in Silicon Valley at the age of 16, researching federal, uh, a federal project for Denver Public Schools to teach Ford students English on the computer, and in this case, looking into various Atari microcomputers and applications that Atari had intended to donate to the Denver Public School System. DPS had the first high school computer lab in the whole country. Uh, a man named Erwin Hoffman started it, and I actually um, did a lot of things at GW under him. He invited me at the age of 12 to start to work in the high school computer lab there after he saw what I was doing with um, a programmable calculator in a math class in junior high under a friend of his who also had a doctorate in math. And uh, then I attended the Air Force Academy later and while there uh, became a Christian, had my world turned upside down in terms of a lot of my views and beliefs. And one of the things that the Lord did to me when I'd been a believer for less than a year is show me the actual identity of the Antichrist. Uh, when I asked him to explain strange imagery, and Revelation 13 to me, and that started me on a journey of writing books, uh, several of which I'm working on to this day. Two to three years from now, God willing, I'll have more than 40 books out, four to zero, all of which are heavily documented. They're all serious works. They're all nonfiction. And um, a number of them, most of them actually took more than a decade each to write. In that series of books, that whole set of books, there are a few multi-volume series, one of which deals with non-terrestrial life. And had you asked me, Alfred, or anyone asked me 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, whether I would have thought there was anything on Mars or the moon or elsewhere in our solar system as evidence that there'd ever been any kind of complex life there before we had gone to the moon, I would have said, no, there's nothing in scripture to indicate that. We have no evidence for that. I would have said, on the other hand, that uh, UFOs are real. You know, they exist. They're anti-gravity craft. Um, the creatures in them are uh, humanoid. I would have told you that since 1986, that time frame. And um, they are related to humanity. You know, their origin, I wouldn't have been able to tell you prior to 
about 1986 or 87. I know that now, what their origin is and what they really are. But they had a hand in the things that actually exist in our solar system, their ancestors did. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So now I am someone who has personally examined uh, through photographs more fossils, uh, obvious fossils, than maybe any other human being alive in history, maybe all of them combined. And that is because I have in my possession literally tens of thousands of examples off Earth of obvious fossils, complex biological fossils, many thousands of really good ones. And uh, they're similar in many cases to what we find on Earth. And in other cases, they're dramatically different in appearance. There are a couple categories of life forms, for example, on Mars that we have no, we can see that they're related to life on Earth, but they are different enough to where we don't really have. Um, a direct analogy or direct comparison to make to anything on earth with them. And uh, so I'll show a couple of examples of that today. And so my background is in hard sciences, computer science, physics, math, chemistry, and uh, computer science is the direction I primarily went, uh, other than theology, I should say theology as well. Um, I'm, I'm arguably based on the evidence in my books and people will think this is a very arrogant statement. I have no problem with them thinking that until they actually go and see what's in my books, the top theologian on earth, Christian theologian. Yeah, and so I'm a really weird, odd person that way. God's got a call on my life to share a lot of new things with humanity, to expose things that both the church and non-Christians have been unaware uh, exist and to give the correct explanations and the real evidence for those things. One of which, of course, is the identity of the Antichrist. The other is the real explanation for fake, and I call them fake, quote unquote, aliens, and actual complex biological life that exists elsewhere in our solar system, some of which might still be alive. So I'll just start with that. And uh, I think that you have showing perhaps a screenshot of a presentation I delivered in 2018, uh, flash fossilized notosaur on Earth. Uh, yes, that okay. that is of what we're um, so I'll give some background right, right now. Let me give a little background to this besides what I've said. Um, I first presented publicly on this topic at a Mars conference in 2016, one of the annual Mars conferences. I had not spoken publicly prior to that. Before that, however, I had done multi-hour interviews with a number of the people who claimed to have been and who do claim to have been on Mars surfaces, surface as part of um, alleged secret space programs. And in those interviews I did, uh, they were typically 10 hours in length each roughly. And uh, Andrew Bajago was among them, William White Crow was, uh, some other people whose names you would know. The interviews are recorded and someday I will share them publicly. I did a follow-up interview with Andrew Bajago. I did a follow-up interview with William Whitecrow, uh, each fairly short. I wasn't able to do much with Andy because at that point his eyes were failing him and he's not actually been able to see any of the things that I'm going to share publicly today with you and your audience. But I did show some of these things in 2016 to the Mars conference to include evidence that either Andrew Bajago had in fact been on Mars or he received information from individuals or entities, and when I say entities, I'm talking about demonic entities, uh, fallen spirits, who had been on Mars in the past. In other words, real information about what's actually there. Andrew Bajago had publicly prior to 2016, for years, in fact, prior to that, described things uh, on air and in programs and in writing that he claimed to have seen on Mars. I personally found evidence of some of those things that are you know, very obvious evidence of some of those things which are not like what we see on earth. They're different enough to where Andy either had seen those things or he received information from somewhere about those things, meaning he was on Mars or he had real information either way. And I shared some of those photos of creatures, fossils that he described to me in the interviews I did with him, some of which he didn't describe to anybody else publicly, but they're in my recorded longer uh, set of interviews with him. I'll show an example of that, which he calls a dump truck sized locust, basically. Um, I'll show that 
today in the, in our photos so people can see an example of that actually existing on Mars. Uh, William White Crow, likewise, he described some things that Andy hadn't described. And I found examples that were either those things or close enough to them to share with him. And I did that in a half hour follow-up interview to capture his reactions live to those things when he saw actual photos, in this case taken by NASA, that he did not know existed, uh, confirming some of the things he claimed were on Mars. Um, apart from all of that, I have a vast array of evidence, including whole categories of different kinds of fossils on Mars and other bodies in our solar system that no one else has described or even know, known exist, unless they might be in a secret space program and have gone to those bodies, though they're not talking publicly if that's the case, obviously. So with that, um, we can proceed, but I'm gonna give a little background, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, excuse me, Alfred, when we start here, so people can accept some of the things I'm sharing so that they can actually understand what's being shown in context. Some things will be very obvious, others would not be without the prior explanation. So we'll be talking a little bit about the nature of fossilization on Earth and what exists here versus other bodies in the solar system and what the differences might be. And with that, I'll let you uh, ask questions before I proceed. Do you have anything you want to ask? Uh, well, well, first of all, uh, I, I just want to state, um, which I mentioned earlier before the show, and I want to share it for the audience that I'm here in a in a dual capacity, I'm uh, along with um, Andy Bishago, I'm uh, the founding chairman and now the chairman of the board of advisors of Mars, the Mars Anomaly Research Society. So it is with great pleasure that we welcome uh, uh, Tim, Timothy Cohen uh, to this program whereby he is sharing to a wider audience uh, on Exopolitics TV and to our, um, uh, you know, subscribers and members, uh, this, uh, this extraordinary find. And um, uh, this is one more chapter uh, uh, in the history of the Mars Anomaly Research Society and in the history of uh, the publication of knowledge about life on Mars, uh, people can go to exopolitics.com and uh, right at the top there, there's a whole uh, uh, links uh, where you can explore the early papers. I know that I... Um, helped uh, Andrew Bishago author his first paper, The Discovery of, the, of Life on Mars, which we then submitted to the National Geographic Society uh, that officially here on Earth is one of the societies whose mission is the recognition of new species. <laughs> now, we haven't heard back from them, but uh, Tim, if you're ever want to, that is one of the institutional channels uh, that you can follow. Uh, the National Geographic Society is, their mission is to recognize new species and you're certainly providing evidence of that. And uh, the Mars Anomaly Research Society would be very happy to join with you, to join their evidence with your evidence and renew our multi-year application, because this was some time ago that we initiated this with the National Geographical Society. And I believe that that is an historical mission that, that should be continued. So that's uh, a, you know, an informal sort of uh, opportunity that I think could be quite, if, you know, given uh, the wind tide behind it, could really change things for the better uh, as far as cosmic awareness here on Earth and elsewhere. So that's, that is sort of how I wanted to uh, 
uh, you know, frame this, uh, this presentation um, in the context of our Mars Anomaly Research Society presentation to the National Geographic Society. And this is in that context. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I would be interested in uh, looking into that. But in fact, the photo that I was showing, the notice or which I'll bring, bring back up here in a little bit, is uh, from the National Geographic. They had shared that in their magazine on a notice or an earth flash fossilized fossil. Okay, so let me just state for the audience, Alfred, and I stated this in our prior interview that you and I had done on the subject of the Antichrist, that uh, to the macroevolutionists, which I would expect most of those who are listening to us to be, many of them, rather than creationists, as I am a young earth creationist, they're going to have a problem probably with some of the things I'm saying. But before our interview is over today, I'm going to overturn, I'm going to turn on their, turn on its head what they think they believe. I'm going to pull the rug right out from under them in terms of the science. They're going to understand that what macroevolutionists have been claiming about the age of our solar system, for example, and how it was formed is literally impossible before this interview is over based on evidence I'm actually going to show. So there'll be a vast amount more in the upcoming series that I mentioned on non-terrestrial life. That series is called Solar Apocalypse, Solar Apocalypse. It's found on Prophecy House's website. That's my publisher, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y-H-O-U-S-E.com. It is not published yet, but it'll be at least seven volumes in addition to some unenumerated volumes on top of that dealing with specific topics. So it's a big work. I've been active on it now for um, close to a decade that I've been working on it and uh, really in high gear since probably 2015, that time frame. So that being said, let's talk about the actual history on earth that a Christian would relate from a purely biblical perspective and talk about the blind spot that exists in Christianity, which I myself also had in the past. And then let's talk about macroevolution and the blind spot that it has. So one of the blind spots. So Christians, of course, would say that dinosaurs, uh, and we dig up the fossils all over the earth, right, were extant between the creation of Adam and Eve just under 6,000 years ago, biblically, for the biblical chronology, the first man and woman created directly by God, not evolved or anything like that, just spoken into existence, Adam, and then Eve created from a rib in Adam's side when Adam was under the equivalent of some form of anesthesia by God, and then God presented the woman to Adam, and humanity was born, you know, the human race started with that, right before the fall of mankind spiritually in the Garden of Eden. That was just under 6,000 years ago. Between that and Noah's flood, which was less than 1,650 years, 1,650 years after that, is when Christians would say the dinosaurs were created. And some Christians think God made them. Others think that the Nephilim, who were human-angel hybrids, were involved in the production of dinosaurs between the fall of mankind early on, uh, just after you know, the start of that creation of Adam and Eve to prior to Noah's flood, which would have been roughly, uh, we'll say 4,350 years ago from now, roughly. Between that time span, they'll say either the dinosaurs were present, you know, and God made them and somehow mankind survived without being destroyed by them. Or they'll say that uh, the Nephilim, human angel hybrids, who were unnatural creatures produced by fallen angels who came into human women, raping those women or taking them as quote-unquote wives to produce unnatural chimeric hybrids, part human, part angelic hybrids, that those Nephilim, those offspring that weren't supposed to exist, set about to remake life on earth to some degree. In other words, to take the life that God actually created here, the natural life, and hybridize it, to remake that life in their own hybrid image in a sense, or to experiment with what God made by, for example, combining the DNA of birds with the DNA of reptiles and other creatures to produce the dangerous dinosaurs. And scientists today, you know, uh, paleontologists will largely acknowledge that dinosaurs like T-Rex, Velociraptor, et cetera, 
appear to be related to both birds and reptiles, biologically. That's really not in dispute at this point uh, by anyone. So that said, Christians having gone that far would still say there's no evidence of life beyond Earth in our solar system. No evidence that the Nephilim left, our, left Earth or did anything beyond Earth, for example. We would say that the Nephilim, those who really understand scripture, are disembodied, uh, excuse me, that the demons are disembodied Nephilim. In other words, demons capable of possessing human beings or other creatures on earth, which wander the earth looking for bodies to possess. The demons we read about, for example, in the New Testament, are not quite the same as angels. They're part angel. But what they really are is the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, the Nephilim who were killed in Noah's flood thousands of years ago on earth when the flood wiped out all life on the planet except what was aboard Noah's Ark. You know, if you take a literal reading of scripture and you believe that history was real, and of course I do, that these Nephilim were wiped out, they became the demons and, you know, they exist in that form on earth and if they possess a human being or another creature in that sense, that human or that creature might, for whatever period the possession continues, be called a Nephil. You know, the, a secondary Nephil if you wanted to go that far. So that's where I started in my understanding of scripture. What the Lord showed me, however, in the last decade, uh, roughly, is that, in fact, the Nephilim were busy all over our solar system. They had left the earth, some of them, and they were transporting these chimeric hybrids, not just putting them here on earth as dangerous dinosaurs, but literally seeding them all across the solar system. In addition to that, our solar system was more habitable prior to Noah's flood, just like the earth was, than today. Our moon had an ocean, a liquid water ocean, and, an, and a breathable oxygenated atmosphere that would have been quite thick, you know, not necessarily dense, but quite thick compared to Earth's. And in the last few years, uh, macroevolutionary astrophysicists have come out, some of them, and said, you know, there seems to be evidence that the moon once had a liquid water ocean and suggesting that it might have existed for perhaps 100,000 to 200,000 years, roughly. They're seeing things on the moon that suggest to them that there was evidence, that there is evidence that once the moon had an atmosphere and an ocean. They're not seeing what I see yet. That time will come. But that's our moon. We can see that one side of our moon is more pockmarked than the other. It was struck by debris, you know, comets and asteroids, and it's more pockmarked and shielded the Earth to an extent. Macroevolutionists will claim that happened billions of years ago when the moon was struck. They'll deny that Noah's flood happened only thousands of years ago on Earth. Then we can look at Mars, and we can see that Mars was once a habitable Earth-like planet, and it has retained some of its atmosphere. Some would say thicker than others. You know, Andrew Bajaga would say it was breathable. It's breathable even now, you know, based on experiences he claims to have had on Mars. NASA would claim that the atmosphere is thin and not breathable, that there is some oxygen remaining, that it's mostly carbon dioxide, et cetera, that the surface of the planet gets very cold at night, and at its highs, can reach the upper 60s to low 70s Fahrenheit during the daytime in the hottest places on Mars every day. That's NASA's claim, in essence. The truth is somewhere in between, and I'll come back to that. Then we have evidence of debris, a debris field, more than one actually in our solar system, but a massive one between Mars and Jupiter, suggesting there had been a past planetary body, or at least one, that no longer exists. It was destroyed, blown up. That's what I would say. Others might say that that debris is just comets and asteroids that formed from gases and never managed to coalesce further into planetoids or planetary bodies. That's what they would claim. So starting with that, the solar system we see today, including Venus, which is very hot, and some people think it was once Earth-like, it's very hot, right? And to our knowledge, could not support life as we know it on Earth in any way, shape, or form, although some think that there might be some bacteria or possible life in the upper, upper areas of Venus's atmosphere based on some things detected in the last uh, few years by, by uh, various satellites and probes. So that's the solar system we see today. I'm going to suggest that only thousands of years ago, our solar system had a habitable, or habitable Mars, not billions of years ago, thousands of years ago, that Mars was habitable, it had liquid water oceans and a breathable atmosphere. 
our moon was habitable, as I described a few minutes ago. Uh, there was at least one habitable and habited body between Jupiter and Mars that was densely populated as Mars was, just as our moon was. The Nephilim, when they seeded this life to other bodies in our solar system, those bodies became densely populated very rapidly, just as Earth did prior to Noah's flood. In that period of 1600 and some years, from the creation of Adam and Eve, which was literally only days after, God began to create the other life on the surface of the earth, meaning the plants, the birds, the, the fish, etc., all the other creatures on earth that God created. That was only days, 24 hour days, roughly. Uh, and I won't go into the exact details of that. The day was slightly longer than 24 hours back then, but, but 24 hour days, the earth had a 360 day year at that time, literally 360 days per year, same amount of time to orbit the sun, but the day itself was physically slightly longer than it is now. We had 12 30-day months on the planet and a more uniform atmosphere globally than today. The Earth was more habitable then than it is today, could sustain life more easily, and life could flourish on Earth more at that time than it can today. And literally within that 1600 and some years, Earth became very, very densely populated, much denser, in fact, than it is today. So with that being stated, where are we? So Earth got bombarded. Yes, sir. Go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry. I, I, I didn't. I thought you were asking me a question. You said, where are we? So can, continue. Oh, okay. So Earth got bombarded. Uh, astrophysicists, non-Christians, evolutionists will look at the surface of the Earth today and see evidence of large impacts of asteroids or comets, meteors. It created craters, some fairly large, you know, and they believe that the dinosaurs were wiped out, they might say 64, 65 million years ago, most of them, from some of those impacts. The evidence of the crater, the craters is not in dispute. Christians do not dispute the evidence of the craters. When they occurred is what is in dispute, and how quickly they occurred is what is in dispute. So Christians would say that that bombardment actually happened a little over 4,300 years ago, between 43 and 44 centuries ago, as triggering events, in fact, for Noah's flood. So what scripture describes is an earth that had a super saturated atmosphere that was thicker than what we have today, where no rainbow could be seen on the surface of the earth. This is only thousands of years ago because that super saturated atmosphere that was thicker would have literally had the light coming in as it does today, but it would have curved and bent and exited the atmosphere before it ever actually reached the surface of the planet, meaning no rainbow could be seen on the surface of the earth at that time. Moreover, it never rained on the earth from the sky prior to Noah's flood. Instead, God had a literal um, sprinkler system, if you will, in the form of geysers built into the entire crust of the habitable surface of the earth, habitable by non-sea creatures not fish, in other words. In that crust, there was a geyser system built in to literally keep the atmosphere moisturized 24-7 and to water the ground so that plants could grow. In addition to that, the atmosphere was more moist, so it was more humid. The entire surface of the Earth experienced more humidity. We had a tropical planet globally at that time, either a super shell, a supercontinental shell, pockmarked by large, we would call lakes or small oceans, or we had one supercontinent that was surrounded by a large ocean. It was one of those two things. Christians can argue about that, but we can see today, looking at the current topography of the planet, that at one time, all the continents and so forth fit together in what looks like either a supercontinent or a shell. That also is not in dispute between Christians and non-Christians and evolutionists. We can see that from what we can photograph from space of the earth today. So with the flood, scripture says the windows of heaven were opened. What that means, and what that means literally is you could see from the surface of the planet directly into space and see the stars where that happened, meaning the atmosphere was literally ripped open in those spots on the earth where the quote-unquote windows of heaven were opened. The planet was struck 
We know that from the pockmarks that can be observed today on the planet, the physical evidence. The supercontinent or that shell, whichever it was, was fractured. And the pillars that supported it, because there was liquid water beneath it, you know, for that geyser system, the pillars that supported that supercontinent were crushed. So that not only was the surface fractured, it began to sink down toward the center of the earth, the core. So the angular momentum of the planet changed and increased slightly, just a little bit. So that the spin of the earth on its axis increased a little bit, physically shortening the days a little and tilting the earth slightly from where it was. And water literally came up from beneath the fractured supercontinent or shell to flood the surface. And on top of that, in addition to that, the super uh, saturated atmosphere, that water vapor canopy that had engulfed the whole surface of the earth globally was collapsed. So that it literally rained for 40 days and 40 nights on the surface of the earth. So the earth flooded from beneath and it flooded from above. And literally all life on the planet died, except what was in the ark and the natural creatures that God made, the ones he allowed to continue to survive in the oceans, they survived. But the dinosaurs, including the ones that were in the seas, there was enough change, acidically and otherwise, in the seas to wipe nearly all of them out, and likewise to wipe everything on the surface of the earth, the dinosaurs that had been on the surface, the, the air-breathing ones, out. Uh, only what was on the ark survived. And the dinosaurs were not brought aboard the ark because they weren't intended to continue to live. They weren't the natural creatures God originally made. And the earth was repopulated quickly after that. And life took root again quickly after that, after the waters began to recede, exactly as we read in Genesis. Christians know these things. Those who've really paid attention, most of them know a lot of this stuff. What they don't know is the fact that the Nephilim did anything elsewhere in our solar system. Likewise, NASA and these space agencies and macroevolutionists don't know this. So if we talk to macroevolutionists, what they will say for the existence of our solar system when they claim that it's billions of years old and likewise claim that, you know, our solar system is three plus billion years old. And if the universe is 14 to 16 or more billion years old, you know, eventually they'll revise that up until the Lord comes back and corrects everybody. Because the universe just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As far as what we can see with our instruments today, it seems to go on and on and on. And when they think they've figured out how big it is, they realize they haven't. It goes even further, the further out we can see with the uh, instruments that we have in space and on the ground. And that's because it's massively large, the universe is. And so they'll keep expanding their age for the universe till God comes back and corrects everyone. And they realize, no, he spoke the whole thing into existence like that. Fully functional from the start, just like Adam and Eve, when they took their first breaths, were fully functioning human beings. They did not grow. They did not evolve. They were not taught. They did not age before they were fully formed adults. When they took their full first breath, you and I looking at them would have seen fully formed, mature adults who had knowledge from the start. God put it in their brains right from the beginning. They had the knowledge, in the case of Adam, to name the animals, in case of, the case of Adam and Eve, to speak with one another intelligently. They had language from the start. They were ready to reproduce in the natural way that we do today from the beginning when they took their first breaths. They would have appeared to be decades old, each of them to us, when in fact they were zero days old when they took their first breath. The exact same thing is true of the universe originally. And when God created our solar system and it was more habitable than it, was to, uh, than it is today, he intended for mankind to one day expand into it and he made it for us to do that. The same thing with the rest of the uh, universe, ultimately. But we screwed it up through rebellion against God. And of course, the fallen angels screwed it up by interacting with humanity, by producing the Nephilim. The Nephilim further screwed it up by seeding things that were dangerous to humanity, both on earth and off earth. And so that's where I want to start. Let's talk about fossils and how old they really are. Yeah. So when oh, we, oh, Okay. We, Okay, yep. I, I feel for the sake of our uh, multi-dimensional listening audience mm -hmm. that we create just a bit of a space for them uh, mm -hmm. because uh, cre a creationist perspective is so seldom heard on yes. the air. And even 
uh, speaking for the Mars Anomaly Research Society, our, for example, application to the National Geographic Society uh, would be in an evolutionist uh, perspective, not in a creationist perspective. So I just wanted to, to say that. Uh, but I, I do have one question. For example, are you saying then that even the anthropological uh, and the archeological record of so many human civilizations uh, uh, is only so many thousand years old according to the creationist perspective. I mean, I, I'm i not talking about geological, it, the, I, I would call the creationist perspective deus ex machina, God and the machine, because you're saying that the universe is just a big machine, that God comes and creates from nothing and creates it in a certain status because there's no evolution from a big bang, which is the other way, right? Uh, and, and so I, I would call yours rather than big bang, I would call it deus ex machina, just to... Okay. So yes, I am saying that they've all existed within the last 6,000 years. They all had their start and their end within and, that time period. And, yeah. and, you, and, and do you honestly believe that, that, that what you've stated is consistent with the, the archeological record, number one, the carbon dating process, number two? So when we talk about carbon dating, we're talking about the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, and there are multiple dating methods that creationists address. In fact, we address all of them. And you'll find lots of creationists who have PhD in the, PhDs in the hard sciences who deal with dating methods directly. So in the case of carbon-12 to carbon-14, prior to know, let's talk about how it's created. When solar radiation reaches the surface of the earth, the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is physically changed. And we have an idea of the rate at which certain radiation reaches the surface of the planet, and therefore the rate at which carbon-12 to carbon-14 is both produced and changed. Before Noah's flood, because that radiation was literally not reaching the surface of the Earth, everything suddenly, like it's a hard wall, literally everything, Alfred, right before Noah's flood, from the point of the flood earlier, appears to be very old. And that's because there's an assumption on the part of those who are using the carbon dating method. They're assuming that what was true 4,000 years ago in terms of the rate of the change of that ratio of carbon-14 carbon was true 5,000 years ago. And the reason they're assuming that is they think Earth's atmosphere was like it was uh, that 5,000 years ago was the same as it was 4,000 years ago. Not thicker, in other words, that We'd see a rainbow, for example, on the surface of the earth like we do today, et cetera. In other words, they're starting with an assumption uh, that is false. They're starting with the assumption that what was true 4,340 years ago was true 4,400 years ago of Earth's atmosphere and the rate at which carbon-12 to carbon-14 was being produced. When in reality, there was a very sudden and hard change by the collapse of that super vapor uh, canopy the thinning of the Earth's atmosphere, and suddenly all this radiation reaching to the surface of the planet that before had never reached it. So in other words, the dating method is actually pretty accurate, going back just to the point of the flood. Anything prior to that looks very old, and the dating method is literally nonsense. It's unusable. When we talk, for example, about Egypt, we see all these pyramids today, right? Like the pyramids of Giza. You can actually go to the top of some of those pyramids, the very top, and you will find seashells encrusted between the rocks, the stones. What's the explanation for that? Those pyramids were completely underwater at the time of the Noah's flood, only at the time of Noah's flood, just thousands of years ago. But in addition to that, there are even more pyramids than are exposed that we know about on the earth today, still buried beneath the sands, and also in some cases buried in the, in the oceans, just off the coasts of Egypt and other places around the world. They're still buried under sediment from the flood. There are all kinds of pyramids yet to be discovered that are actually 
pre-flood constructions. Pyramids were a primary structure on Earth before now was flood. I also know why that is. The explanation for that is given in my books, but briefly it's because the pyramids were a pagan counterfeit, a counterfeit that fallen mankind created to counterfeit something that God was going to bring to the earth in the future. And for us, it's still future. The new Jerusalem that comes down to the earth at the end of the book of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, is described as being the same height, the same depth, the same width. Some people will look at that and they think, okay, that's a cube. That's a mistake. It's actually a giant pyramid. It's a four-sided pyramid that's perfect in its dimensions. That's a huge spacecraft, if you want to call it that. It comes down from the heavens to the earth, a craft actually built by God. And it's so large that only one of it could actually fit inside our moon today, the moon that orbits the current earth. That's how big that craft is. But in that craft, the Lamb of God or the Messiah God incarnate, in this case, Christ Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, the creator of the universe who took on a human body through a virgin birth. He is the God-man, the actual God-man, the creator of the universe. He will dwell in that new Jerusalem among his saints, meaning Christians who've been resurrected or translated who have their eternal bodies at that time in history. That's more than a thousand years from now. His servants who are alive, not dead, in eternal bodies, will be with him, not as disembodied spirits, but physically like you and I have flesh and bone, able to reproduce just like we can today, except eternal bodies that will never die, never grow old, never grow sick, never be hungry, never be thirsty, never have any kind of deprivation, et cetera, never sin, you know, without a sin nature, but perfect, living forever with God who made us in eternal bodies. And we will go into and out of that new Jerusalem, that giant pyramidal city. That's a, that is the real thing that the pyramids of the pagans and the non-Christians throughout history have counterfeited. So, for, for example, in Egypt, they take their pharaoh, their god king, stick him at death in the middle of that pyramid, embalmed to try to somehow preserve the body for a long period of time, kill his servants and bury them with him, along with their treasures for the so-called afterlife. Now, sometimes with, uh, we'll call them... Um, grooves or passageways in the pyramid facing the stars to face Orion or some other location, you know, for the spirits ostensibly to ascend this pagan counterfeit of the real thing that God is bringing just a little more than a millennium from now. So that being said, there's all kinds of things to be discovered beneath the sand still, including technology from before Noah's flood. The earth had, through the Nephilim, Technology capable of traversing not just our solar system, but interstellar travel. And in secret space programs, governments, including the United States government, have some of that technology today acquired in a similar manner to prior to the flood, originally starting with the fallen angels given to the Nephilim, who then shared some of it with mankind who worshiped them as false gods. You know, so humans were taken to other planetary bodies as well, not just humanoids produced from us as unnatural Chimeric hybrids, but enslaved and pagan humans. You know, so there may very well be breakaway civilizations beyond Earth. That is a real possibility that should not be discounted, but they would be saved if they're human in the same way that we are today through belief in the real God. Oh, so that's oh, 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 a little oh, background. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, right. I have one question, and then mm -hmm. we can go th going through to get back to the the yes. uh, life on Mars, et cetera. Uh, uh, from your perspective, where would you put, for example, there's a thing that styles itself as the fifth epochal revelation, the Urantia book. Have, have you heard of it? Yeah. Yes, and, in fact, you talked about it in our prior interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it was published in, in 1955, and it styles itself that Jesus was the fourth revelation in, in flesh, and this is kind of an update, which is the fifth apocalypse revelation as a book. That's its terms, but it is from an, it purports to present an evolutionary perspective of reality. I mean, it, it, it talks, I, I, I was reading 
today just quickly uh, a history of the seven bestowals of the creator sun god, Michael, who one of whose seven bestowals was on this planet as Jesus. And it says his first bestowal on some other place was a quote a billion years ago with conflicts with this perspective, with your perspective. It's an evolutionary perspective. So how, how would you reconcile what I'm stating to you and, and, and just sharing with you right now, the frame of reference that the Arantia book, which is quote, a Christian perspective in the sense that it's about, you know, it's supposedly about the life of Jesus, uh, but it's channeled. How does that relate to what you're saying? Okay, I have to give a little bit of theological background, and I apologize for that in order to properly answer your question, because I need to get into the nature of angels and demons just a little bit more okay. to answer that question. So, you know, Christians talk about God the Father, God the Word, God the Son, as Father, Word, Son, comprising God, the one God who lives. He's not three gods, he's one God, he's Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, God sustains the entire universe by his spirit as a physical thing that he sustains supernaturally that he spoke into existence. The word is the mind of God, took on a human body. That's who Jesus, Yeshua, actually is. That's why he's the creator of the universe, and not some angel or something like that. And in that body in which the word dwells among us as flesh and is returning in the same body in which he rose from the grave, he has the Holy Spirit without measure. So when Christians, when we become Christians and we give our lives to God through Christ, God fills us with his spirit. We get a measure, if you will, of the Holy Spirit, a measure of God who dwells in us. That's not quite the same thing as what happened with the Messiah, with Jesus. He has the spirit of God without measure because he's God. He's literally God who created the universe. He is omnipresent at the same time that he could dwell among us. He can be across the entire universe observing it at the same time. So that being stated, Satan is, the, is among the most powerful group of angels God ever made. They were called the cherubim. That's plural. So Satan was a cherub. But he was not only in that group of the most powerful angels God ever made. He was the messianic cherub. He was the anointed cherub before he transgressed against God. He was in the role of a Messiah to the rest of the angels in God's creation before he transgressed. Scripture tells us he was the anointed cherub, the messianic cherub. So he transgressed, and a third of the angels in heaven transgressed with him. Satan wanted to be God. He was jealous of God. He wanted to put his own throne above the physical universe, above the stars God made. He literally went insane. He was a created being. Eternal and powerful, yes, that's how God made him, but nonetheless a peon compared to the real God, the creator of the universe, a nothing by comparison, if you want us to put it that way. Nevertheless, he deceived a third of the angels, <clears throat> some other cherubim, and then just regular angels, a third of them. A small group of those fallen angels came into human women right after God made life on earth, and produced the Nephilim to then do what they did that I've already described, and in, including to become the demons, the ones who died on earth. Demons, the ones who died off earth in the bombardment that struck earth. There was other things that happened in our solar system that wiped out most, not all, of the Nephilim at that time throughout the whole solar system. That being said, Christians will talk about a counterfeit of the Father the Word, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit, a counterfeit of God. And they would call that Satan, that top angel I'm talking about, who is also known as Lucifer. You know, or Daystar is another translation for this fallen angel, this top fallen angel. Some will translate it as morning star, but a good name that's used is Lucifer, good in the sense that it's an accurate description. That the, the meaning of Lucifer is similar to the meaning of the Hebrew text that's used to describe Satan, this fallen angel. The name Satan is actually a Hebrew word that means adversary. That's the literal translation. So we're talking about an angel who is 
who, sh who shines with a counterfeit light, you know, not a righteous light, but a, a spiritually dark light, who is the top adversary of God. So we call this angel Satan, all right? So people will say that Satan, the Antichrist, and I've already in a prior interview with you talked about who that is, given hard evidence on the actual identity of the foretold Antichrist, who's alive now. Satan, the Antichrist, and then the false prophet is the counterfeit trinity that we read about in scripture. It's not actually quite accurate, and I've realized this myself recently. The false prophet is really not the third member of that counterfeit uh, trinity, if you want to call it that. It's demons who are that, because the third, the, the third thing with God is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit possesses Christians, right, as I've described, and speaks through us, not only teaches us scripture, but helps us to understand it. And does a lot of things, joins us supernaturally into the body of Christ. Christians were joined as a supernatural organism, if you will, to God by virtue of the Holy Spirit. The counterfeit under Satan is demons or these disembodied Nephilim. In other words, they will go about and they will possess humans, for example, and they've been around for thousands of years. In other words, they've actually seen Noah's flood. They've actually seen the destruction in our solar system. They've actually observed the lifespans of humans for thousands of years. They have firsthand knowledge, in other words, of all these things. They've, uh, they've been here, they've observed it, they've lived for thousands of years, like the angels have, both fallen and non-fallen. So demons will possess a human being, and instead of giving the truth through those possessed humans, they will give half-truths or lies. And you know, most people know that the, the most effective lie to deceive anyone is a partial truth, right? People can hang their hat, if you will. They can verify the truth part. And while the rest, they can't verify it, but they'll say, well, they told me this and it's true. So I'm going to accept this over here and just say, okay, they're, they're probably telling me the truth and I'm going to believe it. So when you get into the Urantia book and all these other things, and the Urantia book is just one thing, right? You'll agree with me that there are other stories that are told out there in other religions and through other people who claim to have been oh, spoken yeah. through no, by no, aliens no, or no, spirits. But I, I, I want to focus on the Urantia book just, just, uh -huh. just for this question. Do yes. you think that the Urantia book was channeled by Nephilim is, is my question. Exactly. And that is my point. And the reason is because they can sucker humans who have not been around for thousands of years, who haven't been firsthand witnesses to all this history I've described, right? Uh, they'll tell partial truths. In other words, there are some things that they'll say that are true, mixed with other things that are not. And because we as humans can say, okay, we can hang our hats on this part because we're able to verify this to some extent. The rest of us, we're just going to believe them over here, right? Because we don't know any better. And so we get suckered. And that's exactly what I'm saying. It's the same thing with the carbon dating. If you make a certain assumption that it's always been true, well, at some point you literally fall off the cliff. And in this case, the cliff is when Noah's flood happened. None of it is true prior to Noah's flood. Okay, good. I feel that we've gotten so far away from life on Mars, which, which was the advertised, yeah, let's get into that. Uh, the advertised subject matter that we may have lost our audience. I don't know, but let's get back to life on Mars. All right, so I'm not only gonna talk about life on Mars, Alfred, I'm going to give an example on the moon, our moon. Okay. I'm going to give an example on comets and asteroids. And that is the thing that overturns modern astrophysics, that last thing, okay. completely. So let's start out, though. Let me share my screen again. Let's start out with uh, what is on Earth. Uh, hopefully I can do this right. Yeah, you just hit the, hit the share screen button. There we okay. go. All right, so most people, when they think of dinosaurs on Earth, are typically thinking of bones, skeletons, right? Often encased in rock that have to be dug out, chiseled out, whatever, sometimes partially exposed in the surface of the Earth and then dug out through great labor, you know, right? Transported, put back together, you know, in the equivalent of paleontologist laboratories or workshops and then displayed to us in museums or in other venues. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's such a thing as flash 
fossilized fossils where the entire exterior appearance of the original creature is preserved. Not only is the exterior appearance preserved, but so are the organs inside the creature, so are the cell structures often inside the creature, so that if you were to slice through, for example, this notosaur, this is a fossil on earth. If you were to destroy it by slicing through it, what you would discover is that the organs themselves were suddenly flash fossilized. So you could see the actual structure, in other words, internally inside this thing of the organs. And if you looked more closely, you would even see the structure of some of the cells, the ones that were sufficiently preserved. Flash fossilization, you would look at this and you'd think, how is that possible? And what we know today and what we've known in fact for multiple decades since the early 1980s at the latest is that you can take a whole creature, a big one like a dinosaur such as this one, you can actually fossilize the entire creature in a period of hours to days, a month tops, so quickly that there isn't time for the, the flesh and so forth to decay or it be eaten away to just bones before it fossilizes. We see this today, and this was shown by the National Ge Geographic, this notosaur was found in Canada a number of years ago. It took a man seven years to chisel what you see at a rock right here. This thing is about 30 feet long, I think roughly if I remember right. And so the head that you're seeing is actually uh, more than a foot in length. I think it's about three feet long, the head that you're looking at right there on the left. That notice, that whole thing <clears throat> fossilized in less than a month, probably fossilized within days. We know the chemical process by which that occurs today. And it's a combination of, it requires bacterial activity. So you have to have a lot of microbacteria for something like this to happen. You have to have calcium and, and phosphates, other chemicals in the water, particularly um, certain salts, certain phosphates. And you have to have water within a certain temperature range, liquid water. And when you get that combination and a creature dies, the creature can literally fossilize very, very quickly. And when the water recedes or it gets buried in sediment, uh, what you have afterwards is something like this, either exposed in the surface in the case of receded water, if it's receded enough, or if it's been buried like this was, that has to be chiseled out later when it's discovered from rock that has surrounded it, rock that has formed from sediment that formed around it. That's on Earth. We see this today, and we think it is the exception rather than the rule. On Earth, we think the rule is skeletons, like we go see a T-Rex or a Velociraptor or um, a, Tyrannos, a, a Triceratops or any other number you know that people look at, we would see those skeletons and we would think, well, you know, most fossils are like that. In reality, Alfred, there are a great many flash fossilized fossils, just like this notosaur here, on Earth, often partially exposed, often decayed when they're partially exposed, much more so than on Mars, for example, but often quite decayed on Earth, but partially exposed and waiting to be discovered here on Earth. There are a lot of these things on Earth. There are some things on Earth <clears throat> that no one has discovered that exist only in mythology. And I have proof of their existence. I'll be actually showing proof of what's on Earth in the solar apocalypse series and things that people don't know exist in terms of creatures that are vastly larger than the dinosaurs that humanity knows about. In other words, actual titans that existed on Earth, some titan-sized creatures. I will provide proof of that in the Solar Apocalypse series, proof that can literally be dug up today. So that being said, I want people to see this and now think about this for a moment because then we're gonna to come to what's actually on other bodies in our solar system. So if all we could see was the head, of that notice or Alfred. And let me bring you up so I can still see you and not get my your camera keeps going away or your image doesn't. I'll look in weird places when I do that. I'll look off center from the camera. At any yeah. rate, you can see the uh, notice or here. There's four separate views. It's the exact same fossil, the same head that we're looking at of the same dinosaur that we were looking at in the prior slide. If this was all you could see, 
on the surface of the ground or even just the top two thirds of that, let's say, would you realize that you were seeing something other than a rock? Yeah, I mean, the, this, of course. You might just think it's an ordinary rock, wouldn't you? Maybe with a weird shape that kind of resembles a head. Particularly if you saw that lower right one or the upper right one, you know, from the side, if that's all you saw and some of it was still in dirt, you would probably just dismiss it and not realize that you were looking at one of the greatest fossil finds on earth in history. Just waiting there to be dug up, chiseled out of the rock. Right? Right. Okay. So this is Mars. What we're actually seeing here is one of the rovers drove right up to this, we'll call it a rock for a moment, in the lower right hand section. NASA doesn't hide any of this stuff. They just don't tell the truth about it if they even bother to talk about it at all. So what you're seeing here actually is a piece of flash fossilized wood. It's proof that there was wood on Mars, but it isn't just wood. There's something growing on it. This is a colorized version, automatically colorized. This was not done manually and not done by me of that exact same piece of broken fossilized wood to which the rover literally drove right up to it to photograph it. This stuff that we can see in blue atop that piece of wood is lichen. It looks exactly like lichen on earth does when it grows on rock or on wood. Lichen is complex biology. It doesn't compare to a dinosaur, right? but it is considered to be complex biology. It's a mixture of fungi or fungus and bacteria coexisting in a symbiotic fashion. It's complex biology. That's on Mars and NASA photographed it and they don't hide it, but they know it's there because they drove right up to it to photograph it up close. This is something anybody can pull up on the internet. Just Google Mars iguana. You're looking at a flash fossilized iguana completely exposed on the surface of Mars. You see this, Alfred? Oh yeah, well that's, that's yeah. NASA took four photographs of this. This is one angle. You can see the back leg, the tail has some other things stuck onto it, some other fossils. That's why the tail looks a little weird. The head looks normal, just like an iguana, but it's, it's turned to stone. And you can see the space, by the way, in that back right leg between the leg and the ground under it. That creature fossilized in water that then quickly dissipated from Mars surface right after this thing turned to stone. It was not buried in sediment, though there were some other fossils around it. Nobody had to go dig that out. That's a completely exposed creature on Mars surface that looks almost identical to iguanas on Earth today. You can find these photos by just Googling Mars iguana. You know, NASA doesn't talk about this. And if anybody gets them to talk about it, they'll just try to call it a rock, they'll lie. That iguana is even more obvious than the notosaur that I just showed if all you could see was the head of the notosaur, right? Are you with me? Yes, completely. Okay. Okay. Pretty obvious. And by the way, that photo is not edited. It hasn't been edited by me. It's only been enlarged and cropped. That's it. No changes. <clears throat> yeah. Um, right. There's, uh, I'm, I'm just saying on the RN from the Mars Anomaly Research Society, we have a Facebook group and, uh, in the category of Mars anomalies, uh, uh, photographs are posted there and there are many anomalies that are posted there as well. So you may- Yes, and some of them are, are very good. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And some of them are very, very good. Including This iguana was not found by me. I'm not the first person to see this. I did find it on my own, but others yeah. had actually found this one before me. So yeah. it's likely that somebody has shared this one on the Mars, you know, the Mars Anomaly Research Society web Facebook page uh, in the past. It's probably there.
Okay, and I am gonna skip some things because I want to get into particular items and I'll come back. So this is on Mars. This is one that perplexed me for quite a while till I realized what I was looking at. You know, people have seen this and they've commented on it. I'm not the first person to see this particular object. And they thought, well, it looks like an artificial structure. It doesn't look like a rock. Yeah, that's the initial impression someone might have of this. That is not what it is. And in fact, this was photographed from some distance by the rover. I don't know the exact distance, but I think, and I've got the full photograph, there is more than one of them. I've got the full photograph that shows a portion of the rover in the photo in the background with this thing in front of it. I think that what we're looking at is about the same size as the rover itself meaning it's meters in length. It's not small, I think. But however big it is, it's sticking out of the side of a small hill and exposed on the ground. Are you following me so far with that, Alfred? Yeah, I, okay. I am. I, I have questions uh, prepared. For so me. one of the things that Andrew Bajago said he saw on Mars and William Whitecrow said the same thing is dive bombing pterodactyls. That's what they called them. So on Earth, and in our fossil record, we have pterosaurs and we have pterodactyls. They're a little different from one another. They're similar. The pterosaurs were larger than the pterodactyls, okay? What we're actually seeing here is the head of a pterosaur exposed on Mars surface. And we're not only seeing the head, we're actually seeing a wingtip and some claws off of that wingtip. Just to the right, and imposed between the neck and the beginning of the jaw area of the head is a wing tip, kind of shaped like a bat swing, the tip is. And then just below and to the right of that, you see these two prongs that are sticking out of the ground and there's a shadow beneath the lower one. Those are actually two of the claws off the wing tip. And in fact, in the better version of this photo, which I'll be sharing in the Solar Apocalypse series, you can see a row of teeth between the upper and lower beak. And you can sort of see that it's there at the back of the beak between the upper and lower portion of the beak. If you look closely, that's actually a row of four or five teeth. And I think it's at least five, in fact, that you can see. And then atop the beak, you know, just like on reptiles on earth and certain other creatures, you'll see striations of color, Alfred, right? Where the color isn't uniform, kind of for mm -hmm. camouflage, for example. The color on the lower portion, the lower part of the beak here, the lower half is uniform. The pointed beak, it's not striated. But the top half of the beak is striated. We're not looking at a rock here, in other words. We're looking at a flash fossilized head of a pterosaur where the, the striations, the colors, the tonations are preserved in the fossil of this dead pterosaur's head. And if we could go to Mars today and dig that thing up, we'd find the entire creature right there under the ground. Right, right. Preserved. Now, I, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned God's judgment around Mars. Could you uh, elaborate on uh, the all the causal connections that you you know, what's the background? How, how does Mars differ from Earth in your version of things? So life was created, yeah. People talk about uh, panspermia today. Right. People don't want to, and I'm talking about non-Christians. They don't want to accept the biblical narration, the narrative of scripture that God created Adam and Eve here, that he created life on Earth here originally. This is where it began, in other words. Uh, rather than being seeded to earth from some other place. Uh, because they want to maintain an evolutionary perspective and deny that they have to repent and give their life to God uh, to one extent or another. You know, whether it's conscious or subconscious, they want to deny that. They want some other explanation for how life you know, exists here on earth. So they'll go with evolution. Then you've got a lot of these people who are into quote unquote aliens today who are realizing that macroevolution doesn't actually work. You can go listen, for example, to the ancient aliens television series and I've watched the whole thing. 
in detail. I've paid close attention to it and I've documented things and, and addressed things in it in my solar apocalypse series. So there's literally nothing that they address in it that I don't in turn address from scripture and what's really true and with real evidence. That being said, they'll frequently in that series bring up the fact that evolution on earth doesn't really work. And so they start to turn to people who are promoting this idea of panspermia. And then you get these groups who are saying, well, maybe it came from Mars, right? And so in the not too distant future, I would expect we're gonna see NASA and others when this kind of evidence gets out, trying to lie about it. And I'll just say right now they're lying because I'm telling you in advance, they're gonna be lying about it. And they're gonna say, well, this is evidence that there was life on Mars. And furthermore, because it is so similar in appearance to life that we have in our fossil record here, we think that life got seeded on Earth from Mars. That's what we think. That's what they're going to claim. Wait for it. It'll happen. So that being said, we had these things that got put out there in our solar system by the Nephilim that weren't supposed to exist on Earth or out there. They literally spoiled our solar system so that it would be dangerous for mankind to expand into it. And it wasn't just about spoiling it, Alfred, and I can't get into a lot of detail about this, but one of the goals that Satan and the fallen angels had and the Nephilim and the demons under them is not just to remake life on earth and their image by hybridizing it and ultimately supplanting the life that God made here. In other words, to produce bigger, badder, faster creatures kind of thing to experiment in mass and see what they could do with it. And then to replace the original life God made with this other stuff. They wanted to become the quote unquote gods over their own worlds with these chimeras, these chimeric hybrids that they produced. And they pursued that on Mars. They pursued it on our moon. They pursued it, I believe, on Venus. Though I can't prove it on Venus. They pursued it on other planetary bodies. And I can prove that in our solar system. So, what did God do? You know, because we couldn't go there with a solar system being like that in the future, it'd be too dangerous to us, just like life on earth was becoming too dangerous before the flood due to dangerous dinosaurs, like the T-Rex, the Tyrannosaurus, et cetera, uh, the uh, Velociraptor, yada, yada, et cetera, becoming too dangerous to us and to the other creatures God made. What did God do? He decided to wipe it all out without wiping out humanity and without wiping out the creatures he made. So. The earth became filled with violence, just like Genesis says, and, and we're typically left with the impression that that was because mankind became violent, and certainly that is part of what happened. But in reality, the world became filled with violence, and part of that violence was from these creatures that weren't supposed to exist, these deadly creatures on earth. And so God basically exploded, literally blew to bits, one or more planetary bodies that had been densely populated with these hybrids between Mars and Jupiter, and the entire solar system got pelted from there. Mars got badly pelted, our moon then got badly pelted. Earth was partially shielded, but the portion that wasn't shielded by our moon got pelted, triggering the flood on Earth and the things I earlier described in this interview. So Mars lost most of its atmosphere uh, and the liquid water that was on the surface rapidly fossilized the creatures that suddenly couldn't breathe. They died. They fossilized rapidly. The waters partially receded and evaporated because of Mars' thinned atmosphere. What didn't evaporate receded and became ice. So a lot of Mars' surface, right beneath what we can see, the dirt and the mud and so forth, is actually ice. And NASA will discover that in due course. They're already starting to discover some of that. And it's covered with red dust, some of which is cyanobacteria, rust produced by bacteria. And, uh, and then the rest, of course, is mud and clay and dirt. So Mars got covered in that, and some of the creatures were completely buried. But there's a lot exposed on Mars' surface that did not decay. So on Earth, we had a lot exposed initially after the flood on Earth. More buried than exposed, though, on Earth versus Mars. And on Earth, what was exposed, because we've retained a lot of our atmosphere, and there's been a lot of weathering and decay over a period of thousands of years, and, of course, plant growth, et cetera, much harder to see and recognize on Earth, much more damaged on Earth in most cases. On Mars, however, things are extremely well preserved. And off, you know, quite often, there's very little decay, like we see on this 
you know, partially exposed head and wingtip and claws of the pterosaur in this photo on the screen. On Mars, you can literally just see this stuff exposed on the surface. And the same thing, by the way, is true of our moon. And I mentioned that those bodies, you know, body or bodies, this planetary body that was populated and blown up between Mars and Jupiter that pelted our solar system was densely populated, like Mars, like Earth, like our moon before all this. How do I know that? I can prove that. And I'm gonna give you an actual photo proving that before this interview is over, I'm gonna show you an example. And what am I gonna show? I'm going to show a Titan's head exposed in the surface of a comet, a very obvious head with a jaw, ears, eyes, mouth, nostrils, a huge head that's tens of feet in size, just the head alone, jutting out of the side of a comet. That couldn't be possible. It's only one example of literally thousands I have, and I could have hundreds of thousands if I had the time. That would not be possible if comets and asteroids are really just mud, you know, ice, dirt accumulated from coalescing gases over billions of years. In other words, those bodies cannot be building blocks of planetoids like astrophysicists who are macroevolutionists claim. That explanation for the origin of our solar system, which is the, the starting point for every explanation the macroevolutionists, astrophysicists offer, no matter how their explanations diverge or differ, beyond that starting point, they all start with the idea that all we had was gas initially following the, the Big Bang, if you will, eventually coalesced and coalesced into clumps all over the place till you get groups of gases that then began to form smaller and smaller or bigger and bigger bodies you know, to grains of sand type things up to clumps of dirt, whatever, coalescing over billions of years till you get things the size of, you know, eventually small moons, small comets, small asteroids, just keep accumulating over time gravitationally until you get small planetary bodies, and then eventually things like the moon, like the earth, like the sun, et cetera. You know, they have all these models mathematically and otherwise, otherwise, but it all starts with just gas. And if those explanations were true, there couldn't be any complex biology in comets and asteroids exposed on their surfaces. It just couldn't be there. You couldn't probably find bacteria on the surface of those surfaces of those bodies either unless it had floated through space and landed on them uh, from the Earth, from Mars, or some other body that had complex life on it that could have evolved, and that's in the macroevolutionist perspective, not mine, that could have evolved over time and been blown off the surfaces of those bodies to float through space and land on something like a comet or an asteroid. You, that's the only way you'd find something other than rock, dust, ice, or gas. What they're finding and what they have found, however, on multiple planetary bodies, and, I, and I'll skip over that, I'll come back to that later when I show the actual image that I'm going to share. They're actually all filled with complex biology exposed on their surfaces, every single one of them, photographed by NASA, by the European Space Agency, by JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, all three space agencies at this point have photographed multiple comets and asteroids in our solar system in a number of instances up close. And so we have hundreds of thousands of photos of these objects at this point, and in all of them. And the space agencies are not talking about this, and in a number of instances, they're mentally blind to what they're seeing, but in all of them, complex biology is exposed on the surface, including bodies of entire creatures laying there on the surface of these objects in some cases. Full corpses exposed. So how is that possible? I'll come back to that in a while. Let's continue with uh, what's on Mars. But I wanted to give you some context to this. So I'm gonna say all this stuff was wiped out by God intentionally as part of what also wiped out the dinosaurs on earth and led to Noah's blood thousands of years ago. Oh, oh, so okay. that, yeah. so that so these things could not continue on into uh, it, beyond our solar system and so forth. Right, right, I, I, I see. I feel, um, have you heard of the law of one? 
at all? Refresh me. I have heard of oh, it. Oh, I, yeah, okay. Off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I mean now, so. now the, the law of one version of what occurred uh, uh, on Mars and on the planet that became the asteroid belt, mm -hmm. uh, which was Tiamat, is that 705,000 years ago, there was a reptilian human nuclear war that reduced uh, um, Tiamat, a, a very large verdant human planet to the asteroid belt. Two billion souls that were incarnating there were transferred to Earth, but that war also occurred on Mars uh, at the same time. And there's evidence of it, they said, in that the Mars rovers found uh, uh, the same uh, radioactive nucleides that are used in hydrogen bombs, boom. Uh, uh, so, uh, and that, that left Mars with a thin atmosphere, no surface vegetation, reptiles on the surface, and a human population under the surface of about a million people. The rest were destroyed. And Earth, uh, you know, Earth, the, the repercussions for Earth, Earth has since had its, the humans on Earth has since had, we're, we're the victims of the uh, human diaspora from Lyra when it was attacked by the Draco reptilians. And so uh, here with the last remaining functioning apart from uh, Venus, Venus is very fortunate. I've spoken to Venetians allegedly and, uh, and to a person who spent six weeks on Venus allegedly. They're up at fifth density and they survived their war with the art, sentient artificial intelligence. So they're fortunate. They they ascended, boom. Uh, and and uh, so there's that. I just wanted to say that that is the law of one version. And so just for the record. Yes. OK, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> So I don't know if I use the law of one terminology in my writing uh, and bear in mind, I've written this over a period of several years. So I don't off the top of my head, remember precisely everything always, but um, I do address in great detail, John Brandenburg's claims of radioactivity on Mars. He claims that the equivalent of large nuclear weapons were used on Mars surface and that some of that radiation remains. And he claims that the nature of that radiation could only have originated with radioactive weapons. And that ties into the war you're describing, the alleged war. I have concluded that John Brandenburg is incorrect. And the radiation does exist. It has been detected. But in fact, it can be produced by an asteroid that came near enough to the sun and then struck Mars. So there's more than one possible explanation, in other words, for that radioactive signature that is detected on Mars. And uh, I would say that it fits better in my view with the other things that I've described and that planetary body being blown up and Mars being bombarded to a more severe degree than Earth was. Mars took some of the direct impacts effectively close up compared to Earth and the moon. So it took more impact than Earth did and then our moon did. So the radioactive signature is there. I believe John Brandenburg's explanation, and of course he's a physicist, is wrong. And I had given documentation as well as scientific evidence as to why his explanation is incorrect and why there could be, in fact, is a different, better explanation, which is bombardment by a body that struck Mars from that explosion of the planetoid or planetoids between Mars and Jupiter. That being said, there is evidence of complex technology in the past of artificial structures on Mars surface. I'm not just showing better evidence than anyone has ever been able to produce of complex biology. And I'm about to give some examples of that beyond this pterosaur had even better stuff that no one else has seen. I show evidence of structures, artificial things on Mars 
that cannot be from life and cannot be uh, natural, that people have missed, most people looking at the stuff or all of them in some cases. So there is evidence of a past civilization, in other words, on Mars. There's also evidence of humanoids in the past on Mars. Uh, a humanoid or human breakaway civilization or a combination of the two is what I would actually say, seated there uh, between Noah's flood on Earth uh, and the creation of Adam and Eve. So with that said, uh, yes, there was a war. Yes, God did bring about the destruction on Mars. No, it was not hundreds of thousands of years ago. It was only thousands of years ago. That's what I'll say about that. And probably, not definitively, but probably it didn't involve nuclear weapons. Probably. Okay. Though I wouldn't say it's impossible. All right. So this is something I shared starting in 2016. I shared this with the Mars conference. This image, the one that's a little obscured with the text because I wanna show the unobscured image, including the source to link it. It comes from NASA. NASA is not talking about it at all. I'm gonna give people the ability to download it directly from NASA uh, in these, in fact, I do give it, but I'm just not sharing it yet, in the solar apocalypse series. What you're looking at here is an insectoid creature that's partially human, it's intelligent. It appears to have wings. It's got a folded leg right here. Can you see my cursor? Yes. On your screen. Yeah, Alfred yes, did. we so can. I'm, so I can yeah. point to some things here. Yeah. So yeah, we notice where I'm moving. This is a shoulder joint and around it are nodules right here. And it's, it's more obvious in the better image. This is not the best image. This is what I was willing to share in 2016 and 2018. Anyway, there's this shoulder right here and the leg is folded. So here's the uh, joint and the rest of the leg is hidden right here. Back here are folded wings. You have an amphibian mouth. So it goes around a lot like a frog's mouth, but instead of teeth, there's actually a serrated uh, lip, upper and lower. Right here, where I'm circling, is actually a creature, a small thing that this, this bigger creature is actually eating. It has a rectangular rather than a round earlobe. This is a rectangular ear. It has a bony structure bony or exoskeletal structure across its forehead right here, looks a lot like a crown. It's very obvious in the better images. It has eyes that very strongly resemble human eyes and eyelids right here. It has a nose, a bridge of a nose that comes down in a strange way right here. This creature is completely exposed other than this portion of the leg that's buried on its left side. Around it are all sorts of other complex biological fossils. And behind it in the background is a rectangular box. So this is the uh, full image. I don't have the copyright text on this. This is unedited by me. This is from NASA. I won't say where it exists or anything like that. So NASA can't uh, take it down. But even if they try, I've preserved the whole image just so everybody knows. In the background here is a box. Can you see where I'm circling it? Yes. That box actually has a physical X on it right here. You can't easily see it in this smaller image, but it is a perfect rectangle. The box is not natural. Around this creature right here are all kinds of other fossils sticking up through the ground. They're everywhere, in fact. If I were to enlarge this, they'd be more obvious, but this one right here is perfectly obvious. Here's another image, same thing. Again, I'm gonna present better versions of this in the uh, book, but you can see the nodules again around the shoulder, the folded leg, the amphibian-like mouth, and the lips are really quite incredible. You can't see it easily in this image, but you have vertical serrations around the lip, upper and lower, instead of teeth as if it was designed with this thick, hard lip to chew. Rectangular ear and so forth, and the eyelid is very obvious in the, in the better image. Okay, here's another one that I shared in 2016 and 2018 with the copyright text across it. This is a fully exposed head. There's the ear. It has this incredible ornate uh, neck line at the base of its neck. Each of these is actually a round nodule. 
there's a few of them, one, two, three, four, five, six that are exposed in a curved area around the neckline. The ear, the eye is closed. This is the eyelid. The nose, the bridge of the nose, this is the head right here. It's almost ant-like in shape. I interviewed uh, Tony Rodriguez because of his description of some of the things that he'd seen about this. He hadn't, he didn't give me a perfect description of this, but I did a 10 hour roughly interview segment with him as well. I already had this. What is the uh, scale? What is the scale of that head? That head is very far in the background from the rover. I don't know exactly what its size is because I haven't taken the time to precisely figure it out, though I think I could. Could be wrong, but I think that head is as big as or bigger than the rover itself. It's pretty big. And off of it are mandibles right here, two of them off the nose. I call them mandibles, but if you see the better resolution of this, and I will share it in the book, it's got a woven pattern, kind of like uh, a braid. If you saw a girl with uh, a braided hair, right? The pattern on each of these mandibles is actually braided, and you can see it in the higher resolution image of this head. This is another fossilized head back here, partially exposed. There's another one right here, and that's the nose right there. You can't easily see that in the image that I'm sharing here. Here's the uh, same thing with the copyright text a bit further away. You can see this when it's not as blown up, it's a little less fuzzy. Here's another head. Okay, so this head is not looking straight up, right? It's horizontal on the surface of Mars. Just as this is horizontal on the surface of Mars, right? This head on the other hand is sticking straight up looking toward the sky. Most of the heads that are exposed on Mars surface are like this, you know, or they're a creature looking straight up pointed to the sky. There's a reason for that. And that is when the catastrophe occurred on Mars and the same thing happened on our moon and so forth. When the catastrophe occurred and these creatures were suddenly buried and the atmosphere was suddenly thin, ripped away and they suddenly couldn't breathe and they were buried and so forth, they literally tried to claw their way or make their way to the surface. Some creatures survived, like this one that's fully horizontal here, past that point, and were able to fully expose themselves on the surface. Others tried to make their way to the surface to breathe, to survive, in other words. They took their final breaths as they breached the surface and died right there in place and fossilized right there, frozen in time. And there's an enormous number of exposed head, heads on Mars surface like that, more looking straight up toward the sky than uh, are horizontally preserved like these right here. I love the horizontal ones, right? Because they're just really easy to recognize when we see them, okay? And by the way, this is not color adjusted. I wanna point that out, Alfred. This is as NASA shared it, okay? Right. In other words, these details can be made more obvious by simply adjusting brightness and contrast or doing some automatic adjustments that involve no manual editing whatsoever, okay? Just to point that out. By the way, I don't know if you can see it back here where I'm circling with the uh, mouse is another head. These are nostrils, there's the mouth, there's the forehead, a little head, partially exposed. They're all over the surface of Mars like that. Here's another one, nostrils mouth, the eye area, partially exposed head. A lot of these are not really obvious to you who have looked at these things for a while and really just they stand out at you because you realize what you're seeing. But then there are others like this that are extremely obvious. So for example, this might not be so obvious. This is, this is fairly enlarged, but again, it's not adjusted. This is actually a reptile, the head, partial neck, the head biting down on the head of another reptile. That's how they died. Mm -hmm on the mm. surface of Mars, one creature biting down on the head of another. Mm. All right, this is as NASA presented it. NASA has realized, some people at NASA, that this exists and they've put out some other images, alternate versions of this, where they've intentionally destroyed the image. Fortunately, I have the originals and links to the originals still, and we'll be sharing that with the audience. You have two creatures staring at each other across the divide. This is unedited, so this is not edited, not color adjusted. 
Uh, it's a little bit enlarged. This is how NASA shared it initially, okay? If you'll notice the red right here, that's a red reptilian eye. This is the head of a dinosaur, an actual dinosaur sticking out from behind a hill on the surface of Mars, looking at a bird-like creature with the wings hanging off of its, I'll call them arms, its legs right here. The wings are just hanging down here, kind of like you'd see on a bat. It has a pointed head in the back, sort of like a uh, pterodactyl, but not quite, kind of in between a pterodactyl and pterosaur. The eyes, the nose, this is not enlarged uh, by me right here, right? If you can see these details. And in between them is another thing they're looking at. There's actually a creature in between them, okay? You can't see it in the detail that I'm showing right here. Here's the same thing, a little enlarged and color adjusted. You see the difference? There's the eye again, the mouth, the reptile sticking out from my nail looking at this, they're staring at each other across this little divide here. Same thing again. Now you can see a little more. You can see what this thing is sticking out from behind. Up here are some flash fossilized fossils. This is one. There's the mouth and the eyes and the head right here. Just laying there on the surface exposed, partially exposed through the rock. That's how it died. This is a dinosaur's head sticking out from behind. This rock looking at this thing across the valley. Same thing again. <clears throat> All right. There are other examples where legs, including knees, are exposed and creatures are fully exposed on the surface of Mars, sometimes scurrying across the surface. Usually they're dead. They're flash fossilized in place like that iguana that I showed earlier. This is one I found. Nobody else has found this or shown it. Um, I showed this back in 2016. It's a little bit of a dog-like creature, kind of angular head. Got a bent knee, a back leg exposed here. Some shadow exposed from it. It's actually looking at some other things over here that I'm not showing. This is a head popped through the surface, staring at this right here. Both fossils, I believe. This one's hard to see again. It's a great magnification, but it's a humanoid face on a very strange, almost, I'd say, I wanna say turtle-like reptilian body, but there's not a shell here. It's got these weird appendages that are sticking out here. I think that's a creature staring across the valley. This thing right here is actually in the vicinity of this right here. But um, again, not color adjusted. When you make it smaller, I don't know if I can do that right here. It becomes a little more obvious. Can you kind of see this a little better right here, even though it's smaller? Well, more obvious as a creature. Yeah, yeah. The 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 features are more, a bit more definite. Yeah, it's got this very rough skin, fossilization on the outside of it. But the face, the head, is why I shared it. It's unusual. All right, this one is a bigger deal. So Andrew Bajagos, uh, and again, this is not the largest I have, but let me see if I can enlarge it a little bit. Andy shared with me in my 10, 10 hours of interviewing him uh, that he had seen and been told about in the secret space program he says he participated in something called a dump truck sized locust, a large carnivorous locust like creature with three legs on each side uh, and a, uh, uh, a mantid like head. But he described this creature and, and not able to fly. But if you look at this, this is a fossil that I found on Mars surface. Here's another uh, version of the same thing. It's got copyright text going across it. It's got this V-shaped structure on the back, a segmented body. It's got a um, mantid-like head, a heart-shaped head here on the left, two eyes that have ridges around them, a mouth, a nose, there's a very obvious eye, uh, head, pardon me, in the better image. This is actually a humanoid head and in the better image, and I'm not sharing it here, but I'm doing the best I can with what I was willing to share back then. This is a humanoid head right here between its front legs. So these are its front legs right here. They're jointed, They're, the other leg is over here. You can see the interior part of it right here. So you got three fully exposed legs that are segmented on the side of this, the back legs, the middle, and the front upper, okay? With this V-shaped structure in the place of wings, the main body segment 
and the rest of it going to the head up here. This is the creature that Andy described to me in detail in my 10 hours of interviews with him that I've not publicly shared. I wanted to show this to him at the uh, Mars conference in 2016, but at that point he couldn't make it and his eyes were too deteriorated to see it. Right. But the key, the key takeaway here is he told me about this in my interviewing him before he knew anything about me. He didn't know that I had any of these photos at all. He knew nothing whatsoever about me, but he was willing to be interviewed by me. And um, so that's where I started with him. Right, isn't that and, interesting? Yeah, so yep. that's, that's mutual verification. It's proof that he was on Mars and saw this thing, or he was in a program where they told him about this thing, or a demon saw this thing in the past on Mars and described it to him or through him. It's one of those three things. People can make up their own mind on that. Of course, I have a lot to say about it. In the Solar Apocalypse series, I have an entire volume that deals with the people who claim to have been part of the secret space programs, the ones who are alleged to be most credible, including Andy, going through my evidence and the reasons I think give specific individuals are credible or not credible. And then of course, letting people make up their own minds based on the evidence I'm able to present in all cases. So this is where I talk about Andy in 2016, for example. So, all right. I won't say too much about this, but I'll point out a couple of things. This is probably hard to see it on people's screens very clearly, but so a rover, I believe it was a spirit rover off the top of my head, took a series of images of what you're seeing here in the background in uh, black and white grayscale. Right. And this is actually a tail coming off of this thing right here. It's a very obvious tail. Okay. You can see it's split in the middle right here. You can't believe what I'm saying from me just calling this a tail at this enlargement level. So I don't expect that. I'm just telling you what it is for the moment without expecting to be viewed as credible necessarily. Okay. There's a creature right here with rabbit-like ears. You can't see it, but uh, I know it's there from larger versions of the photo. Okay. There is something else uh, that'll show up over here. So between this thing here and this crack here and what I'm gonna show you over here, uh -huh. there's movement between the series of photos. In other words, evidence of continuing life on Mars. Right. So this is the same thing. That's the same tail-like object, same crack that I described right there. Right. And you can see over here, I want you to notice how this looks, what is in the image, okay? So I'm gonna show you some things in the image that aren't here right now in another image. So pay attention to this area here, okay? And by the way, notice this right here, okay? These are the pointy ears I said are on the rabbit-like thing. This is kind of a poor image where you can't really see it clearly right here. But I just want you to notice this thing right here where the mouse is between this and between this, between these two things. And then of course is this tail-like structure that I mentioned. All right, here's the next image. Notice that that thing, the ears are gone. It's not here in this image. You do see the, the uh, crack. You do see that tail-like thing, right? Mm -hmm. Again, uh, that ear-like thing, not here. You see the crack. You see the tail-like thing. Okay. And if we go across here in this, Kind of want you to see what's in all of this here. Get a feel for it. I'll go back to this one again. Same thing if I go across. Notice what's here. Okay, so you'll and now you'll have to tell us what what oh, I'm gonna show what you. What are we yeah, yeah, what are we looking at? I'm gonna for? show you. You notice the crack is not so obvious here. Suddenly oh, yeah. right here. Yeah. Here's the tail like thing. Okay. Yeah. Notice what you see here. It looks a little different. This is actually a nostrils, mouth, eyes of another thing. I, I don't see. really care about that. It's not actually a good example. I, I'm pointing I out see. It's so, so all around the, here are the, fossils. I, so you're saying that 
Are those living creatures or fossilized creatures? What I'm showing here, not living, yeah. I don't think. Okay. I'm going to show you, however, something that is moving in the midst of these things. I see. So notice this thing right here. Mm -hmm. Not a great image. Let me show you what that looks like, that thing, in a better image, and then I'll come back to this. I call it the photobomber. <laughs> For lack of a better term, I think I got it in here. I'll be shocked if I didn't include it in here. Well, that would not be cool. All right. Well, somehow it's not in my images. So anyway, you'll have to look at it like this. I apologize. I don't have the better version of it in this image to show you. Uh, anyway, there's something here. I just want you to see it's right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's gone now it's right here okay and you see this ear like thing again yeah okay so let's take a closer look at this i'm going to make this smaller so that you can see more perspective there's a thing with the ears here's the thing i showed you a minute ago the thing with the ears not here right the thing i showed you a minute ago over here instead of over here yeah you see it was here now it's here. Right. Okay, so here, 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 here. That's not its only movement. Here it is again, the thing with the ears. And... Um, So these are the two rock-like things again that you were looking at a minute ago. Nothing mm -hmm. right here with them, right? These two things here, and you can see what is and isn't in the background here, mm -hmm. are the same two as these right here. Right. And as these right here. Mm -hmm. With these right here, you can see that thing right there. Right. And again, with these right here, instead of that thing being over here, now it's over here. Over here, right, right. I see that. And I wish I had the uh, larger version of this to show you. But for whatever reason, I don't have it in this series of slides. So my apologies on that. At any rate, I wanted you simply to see that there's some change between these images, this series of images, particularly with this thing. And ostensibly with that thing that appears to have ears showing up over here or not at different points, right? And then that thing, this thing right here, we've mm -hmm. seen it here and we've seen it here, right? We've seen it in both places. And then in this image, it's not in any of those places. It's not here, it's not here, and it's not here. It's gone in this image. It's totally missing. Right? It's not here and it isn't here. So it's not there at all. Now it's over here. Again, over here. Now it's over here. You see that? Mm -hmm. And up here, it's completely absent from the image. It's not here and it's not here. So all that is to say, between that series of photos by this rover, and this is part of the rover here in the foreground, so you can see these, these things over here. It's not that far away. Something moved into and out of the photo, right? There's not enough wind on Mars, according to NASA, for anything to have been blown into the photo like that with any kind of serious mass. It is suggesting that a creature of some sort, and it is a creature of some sort with a shell on its back, actually. And unfortunately, I don't have the better photo of it in this series to show you. I don't know how I had that oversight, but I did. But anyway, it's moving in and out of the photo. That suggests to me that there probably is ongoing life on Mars' surface, right? So now you see it, then you see it, then you don't, between those images that I shared. All right, this is a pretty significant image. 
Are you seeing this right here? Yes. That's not photographed on the ground. It is on Mars surface, but it is so large that it could only be seen from space. Whoa. How large do you suppose that is, Alfred? Well, it, it's 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 saying that it's 34 miles long. Here. Oh, well, okay, yeah. I, I'm shooting myself in the foot by even asking, right? Because I said how long it is. All right, it is. It's 34 miles in length, roughly. That's just the exposed portion right here, okay? And, and there and, is, mm -hmm. yeah, you're not what looking did, at it. Uh -huh. No, no, sorry, go, go ahead. You're not looking at a series of dunes. It is not possible for any combination of geologic activity to produce a series of dunes or ice structures or mountains or anything else with this patterning that grows from smaller and integrated to larger and integrated in a scale-like pattern like you'd see on a scaly creature, like on a reptile, okay? The only thing that can produce this sort of a pattern is life. That's my opinion. I'm going to state that scientifically without going into the evidence for that. Those who know anything about biology and about life on Earth and about actual geologic processes in nature who have that combination of knowledge would back up what I'm saying and tell you that nature cannot produce this through geologic processes. Okay? What you're seeing right here? And of course, as I said, that's just the exposed portion. This ice around it that's smooth, what's around it is ice. Each of these things that you're seeing right here, when you're talking about something that's about 34 miles in length, these are the size of mountains. Are you getting that? Even these smaller ones are the size of decent sized hills or mountains. Mm -hmm. These tiny little scales, okay? So NASA, JPL, took an infrared of this object. They took more than one kind of image. This is the whole thing right here. In other words, this is the portion that you just saw. This is what's exposed through ice. This is the infrared of it. You can see it goes further over here, right? Mm -hmm. And a little bit of it back here. This is what's buried under the ice. The overall length is maybe 70, 75 miles in length, perhaps, roughly almost twice as large as what's exposed in the ice, exposed to the surface. Now, is, is that a, a, a fossil, of, obviously, then? Well, there are two possibilities. It's an artificial structure. But then you have to ask, who would build something like that, that big, right? On the surface of a planetary body, you know, and it could only be seen from space. and why make it look like scales, okay? That's a possibility, but who would do that, right? And who could do that? It's not mountains, I'll tell you that right now. It's scientifically impossible for what you're looking at to be mountains through natural processes. It's either artificial or it is a gigantic titan-sized fossil that would make Godzilla look like a, you know, <laughs> like, like a, a teacup poodle by comparison, <laughs> if so big, okay? Oh, no. I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's 70 saw, miles and Godzilla would be like a flea. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, if you saw um, <clears throat> a Cloverfield, I think it was a second Cloverfield movie. At the very end, they've got a teaser in that movie where a giant reptilian creature, a Godzilla-like creature, presumably, but a, a head that resembles Godzilla's, is literally in the clouds. You know, it's standing on the earth, but the head is up in the clouds. In other words, the thing is miles in height, probably. Okay. What they're portraying at the end of that teaser of Cloverfield. Even that creature, a creature that size, would be very small compared to what you're seeing here on the screen. Okay, it would take several creatures that size to be the length of just what you're seeing here on the screen. Photograph more of it, okay? And yet the real length of this is perhaps 70, 75 miles, whatever I calculated it to be. I actually did take the time to, to get a scale on this thing here. And uh, 
So I will say that um, JPL talked about this object privately. And they said that to them, it looks like a reptile. They basically said it looks like a creature. And then they said nothing further. In other words, they wouldn't allow themselves to admit that that's what NASA had photographed. Because for one, <clears throat> it's too big. For two, it's impossible to explain by any science that we know. Although our science today, biology, for example, will admit that reptiles, as long as they don't die, seem to just keep growing and growing and growing and growing, right? They just get bigger and bigger over time if they don't die. So we could our, ask ourselves, and it's reasonable at this point to ask ourselves, what might the Nephilim have achieved with their hybridization of the creatures God made on earth and tampering with the genomes to perhaps allow unfettered growth to accelerate growth to maybe allow creatures such as reptiles to absorb nutrients directly through their skin so that they don't actually, actually have to eat to continue growing, in other words, the way that we would eat. And by the way, there are reptiles on earth, a certain category of them that do in fact absorb nutrients through their skin and can grow from that if they absorb enough. And there are reports that grays, gray humanoids, absorb nutrients through their skin, that that's how they consume nutrients, all right? And grays do exist uh, as part human, humanoids who are chimeric hybrids and they're not supposed to exist. They're fake aliens, but they exist. There are some of the creatures in the anti-gravity craft that are not ours. So what I've shown to this point, Alfred, is evidence of complex biology on Mars surface. Before I go on to show more of that and what's in comets and asteroids, let me give some better examples of what's on Mars. And frankly, what I've shown some of these things is better than anyone else has ever produced. In other words, segmented legs that are obvious, geometry that can't be produced in nature unless it was grown or produced artificially, okay? No matter how you slice or dice those things, it's proof of intelligent life at one point influencing Mars and putting things on Mars. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's proof that Mars was habited in the past, if not currently. And then of course, the evidence I suggested of movement of Mars indicates that perhaps there's current life still surviving on Mars to some extent. Some creatures have adapted, in other words, to survive. All right, so these photos are all from Mars. These are a few examples. You see, for example, this one is numbered 21,505. I didn't skip numbers <laughs> uh, in numbering these. We, yeah, we're, we're I, still on, on the impossible creature size uh, yeah. slide. Okay, well, this is, this is terrestrial. You can see this on the surface of Mars. Okay, oh, okay. This is not the size of... So you're not seeing this. You are seeing no. it on the slideshow? Yeah, we're, okay. right. we're, we're still on the slide right. that says impossible me, creature size. All right, let me fix that. Thank you for telling me that. Or I would have rambled on and people would have said, what are you talking about? Okay. You see it now? Yes, now we can see uh, a matrix of photographs. Okay. Uh, when it's the same thing, it's because I enlarge these to different sizes so I could have ready-made enlargements to share in different venues. Right. These are not edited other than being enlarged. There's no adjustment to brightness, contrast, sharpness, nothing whatsoever. This is as NASA photographed them, just some of them are enlarged, that's all. Okay. Okay. These were photographed by the rover. All, everything I'm going to show here, photographed by the rover. These are only a few examples. So for example, between 21,499 and 21,506, these are all the same object, right? So you might say, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know. I've got eight instances, right? So if you divide 21,000 by eight, you might think I've got a few thousand different things here, right? I've actually got uh, several thousand in this set. I've got hundreds out of several thousand. I've actually got tens of thousands of images, however, that I've decided were worthwhile enough to capture and eventually share. 
These are only a few of them. If I could take the time, Alfred, I or anyone else could have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of images like this that NASA has already photographed with its rovers, not including Perseverance, okay? Perseverance has taken some pretty stunning photos too that people have missed. But this is what you're seeing here. This is just curiosity, some of these, okay? Again, flash fossilized. So remember what I shared when we saw just the head of that notosaur on Earth and how hard that might have been to recognize if you didn't realize you were looking at a flash fossilized fossil. And I've already described what happened to, to an extent on Mars that creatures, those who were not able to fully reach the surface after the cataclysm on Mars to try to survive, just managed to expose their heads off and either looking straight up or the side of their heads to try to take their final breath and they died right there. They couldn't breathe. They died and fossilized in place, partially exposed right like that. And in many cases were not further buried by the cataclysm, all right? So they're exposed enough for us to see them. Well, there are things like this right here. And I don't know the scales of what these are off the top of my head because they're all as thumbnails shown about the same size. But at any rate, let me see if I can just open one of these an ear fund view and I'll enlarge it just a little bit and I'll do an automatic adjustment. Yeah, we're, uh -huh. we're still with the original matrix of, of, of all of the photographs, if, if that's your okay. intention. It's so not, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why it's doing that, but let's stop the share and go to this here and if there's a way to share my screen rather than the window. I'm trying to share the screen. Um, sc okay. All right. I understand. Let me try sharing this. Now do you see it? Yes. Okay. I think this is what I was intending to do and not succeeding. Look at the geometry on this. There's symmetry left and right. You're looking yes. at the right side of a head. This is the eye area. Mm -hmm. nose area this would be a nostril mm. but look at the perfect symmetry left and right here the right. eye area is raised here same thing here rectangular back here and going to the back the back of the head this is a partially exposed head fairly angular more angular than most heads that we'd see of a creature on earth unless it were say an insect right mm -hmm. this is a good sized head good sized head i have several hundred examples of highly angular, perfectly symmetrical heads like this exposed on Mars surface. On this one, the mouth is closed, so you can't make any details at all out for the interior of the mouth. There are others where the mouth is open where you can literally see the tongue. Sometimes you can see the teeth. Sometimes you can see the back of the mouth area to the throat where it's then fossilized and cased in stone. Sometimes you can see the eyes to the point where there are lids, there are visible eye whites, there are visible pupils. The sclera is preserved. So one point I want to make, when we were looking at that flash fossilized notosaur on Earth, you could see in that National Geographic photo that it was brownish and greenish, the color on the outside, right? It was chiseled out of stone that was not that color. In other words, the exterior pigmentation of the scales and skin of that notosaur had actually been preserved as part of the fossil on Earth. The same thing has happened on Mars. On Mars, many of the flash fossilized creatures, their exterior appearance, not only the shape, but the colors also were preserved. Like we saw the striations across the beak of that uh, pterosaur's head that I pointed out earlier, right? Some of them are very rock-like in coloration like this one that we have on the screen. Others are extremely colorful. Um, and I'll get to some colorful examples in a bit, but I want to show some just examples of symmetry that can't happen in nature in just a plain old rock. So this is almost cloven. You notice this right here? Center line. Perfect symmetry left and right here. I don't actually know what this is a fossil of, but it goes back in a triangular fashion here. you get symmetry that's not natural for a plain old rock, per se, something like that.
when we look at, um, let's say, this for a moment. You see this white line right here? That I'm moving the mouse across? Right. That's actually the teeth and the gum line of a fossilized head. Huh. Sometimes the gum line is white like that. Sometimes it's pink, like you might expect. Sometimes it's dark, like you might see on a darkened lip. I'll show you some examples. Hmm. So this one here, it's white. Um, this is unadjusted, not sharp or anything else. This is how NASA photographed it from a distance. Right. It's just an automatic adjustment. This is the eye area, the nose, the mouth area, the upper or the uh, lower jaw, the upper jaw area, part of the head sticking out of the side of the ground right here. At least as obvious, I would say, as that notosaurus head, if that's all you could have seen. Not a great example. I would call that one an average example. I particularly like this one, but I have better examples. This one I'm about to show you. So this is a creature, there's the nose, lower mouth, lower jawline, upper head right here to the, to the forehead, almost going up to it, the bridge of the nose. I'm just outlining it with the mouth. You'll notice the lips are dark right here. The mouth on this one is actually opened. That's not adjusted. There's a just a little bit. You can see it sticking up out of the ground right here. There's the nostril area right here. Right. Okay. Here are some different enlargements of the same thing. As I flip through it, people's brains might allow them to see it a little more easily. Right. This is one with a beak right here and an eye. Okay, I won't go into this one. This is another fossil right here. And I'm not gonna even go into this beak very long because I've got much better examples I'm gonna show. But you can sort of see the beak structure right here. Right. That's the center line, the eye right. area, the back of the head, and the top of the head right here. Right. Part of the head from the left side. Not a great example. I'm going to show good ones, though. I just want to give you an idea for a moment of just average things before I show some of the better ones so people can get an idea of what's average on Mars. When they really start to look, these things are all over the place. So this is an average one. Let me auto adjust it. Eye area, nose area, lower mouth area, mouth area. Part of a head, partially exposed to the surface. You'll notice the color of this is different from what's around it, right? That's unadjusted, it's not edited by me or anyone else. That's the actual color. It's different from what's around it because it's a head. And it's in the shape of a head, partially exposed. Very average, not a great example. Here's a pretty shocking example. Pointed ear. I, this is not the best example. This is what I'm willing to share publicly right now. Here is a sharper, more focused version of this. Visible eye with sclera is actually what you can see in the better image. Beak-like pointed nose part. This head is literally popped through the ground and this is part of a shadow behind it right here. Pointy ear, popped right through the surface of Mars. Okay, I won't go into that one. Is that a fossil or a living creature? Which one, this? They are. I think it's a fossil. Right. I think it was a living creature for sure. Right. I think it's a fossil. Um, that's a fossil too, but this one's a little harder to see. There's two eyes right here, mm -hmm. the top of head. Not a great example, so I won't go into details on that one. This is just a set from the same area. This one has visible teeth. And if you could see it more focused, you'd see four teeth clearly right here on the side. Fossil ahead sticking up through the ground. If I make it smaller, the teeth might become a little more obvious. You can see the lines here. Okay. Let me get into 
some more incredible things here. All right. This is one I like uh, because of the eye on it. So let me show this again. This is unedited. This one is looking straight up. It's not looking, it's looking straight up. This is how it died. Let me auto adjust it. You'll notice the eye right here. This is the eye right here, big eye. Notice the slit, wow. like a reptilian eye. Mm -hmm. That's how this one fossilized. This is the tip of the nose. This is the head right here, sticking up straight up, looking up toward the sky through the ground. That's how it's, it died with its eye open right there mm. and fossilized. Now, I won't stop on these until I see one that I definitely want to share. I'll, I'll share this one because I just think, wow, it's kind of cool. It looks a bit like an iron with an ironing board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sticking straight up through the ground, this part appears to be flat. Mm -hmm. Looks just like an iron from an ironing board in terms of the outline almost right here. Mm -hmm. Not focused, you know, I haven't done anything to adjust it except right now just uh, adjusted the brightness and contrast, right? There's the shadow from it. You can see that it is pointy if I make it a little bit smaller. Right. More obvious, let's look at, sometimes you have to make them a little smaller for them to be more obvious. I'll come back to that one because that's pretty weird. Um, that one is, so is this. I'll just zip through some of these actually because I want to get right. some of the better stuff without belaboring this. Eye, nostrils, mouth, kind of resi resembles a cow's head right here a little bit. I mean, that's not what it is, but a fossil sticking through the ground, not a great example, but it caught my eye. Right. This one's pretty stunning. Frankly, if, if this wasn't over here on the right-hand side where I'm circling it, right. I would have just ignored this whole thing and not cared. Uh-huh. Okay. You're familiar with staple removers. Everybody's seen staple removers, right? Mm -hmm. Take a look at this. Just like you'd see on the end of a staple remover almost. Mm. Perfect rectangle right here. Right. With a with a cavity right here. Right. And maybe a fang or something pointy right here, maybe because the curve continues smoothly on down to here below what I'm gonna call the jawline. I think this is a head, huh. not a great example of a head. And I think this is the nose. This is an example of a very angular, strange <coughs> front of the head. It's either the front or the back of the head, I think. Right. But whatever this is, it is not a natural rock. Right. So you can call it artificial if you want, I don't care. You can call it possibly the end of a very strange head, which is what I think it is. I don't care. If you agree it's either one of those things, it's proof of complex biological life on Mars at some point. Right. By itself, that, that geometry can't be natural in terms of it's not producible through natural geologic processes. It is producible through growing life if you have the right combination of genes. All right, this is a cow-like head sticking through the surface of Mars. Let me auto adjust this and I'll, I'll enlarge it. You can see the mouth line right. closed, the lower jaw, the nostril. You can follow the shape here, there's the eye. The head goes on up, so I'm tracing the head right here. Unedited, other than just having adjusted the brightness or contrast a little bit, let's look at different enlargements of it so you can see it at different enlargements. Just follow it as I zoomed in and out. Okay. That's the side profile of a head sticking through Mars surface. And I have lots of examples of fully exposed creatures. I'm only going to share a few, and I will show some others. Um, oh. How do you correct for pareidolia? Well, you don't. Uh, pareidolia, pareidolia means seeing an object that's not there, right? It's a psychological uh, condition. Yeah, seeing, seeing uh, you know, seeing a head Imagining where, something. where there's a rock. You're seeing, you know. There are certain things that can happen in nature with rocks. 
and there are things that can't happen in nature with a rock. So for example, right. when we saw that uh, head of the uh, nodosaur on Earth, if that's all you could have seen and it was exposed and they didn't actually have to chisel a thing out of rock for seven years, if all you could have seen was that head, almost everybody would have said, that's just a rock. You're seeing something if you think that's a head, right? And yet behind it was the fully preserved body of a, of a creature. Right. I can show fully exposed far superior heads to that one on the surface of Mars, just sitting there exposed. Nobody has to dig them out. And I'm actually going to do that before we're done here. I'll give some examples of fully exposed, fantastic heads. So let me just grab one. So this is a good head. Not perfect, it's average, but it is a good head. Let's auto adjust it. This one's mouth was a little bit open. The teeth are rotted away. That's part of the tongue. Lower mouth, upper jawline, the head sticking through the ground a little bit. You can zoom in and out of that. You can see it's different, obviously, from the background, right? Well, let me go back to that one. Okay. Another head, very poor example, this one. Um, sticking out of the surface of Mars. You can kind of see some of it right here, the eye area, the nose, lower mouth area. Not a good example at all, but I thought it was interesting to capture it. All right, this one is fabulous, but it's small right here. I showed you this one a bit earlier, Alfred, right? Right. That's extraordinary. This one is extraordinary. And here's why. When we auto adjust it, you're actually looking at a creature that popped its entire head to the surface. Lower mouth area, nostril area, eye area. There's the head area. Two exposed legs. It's the shoulder area, bent leg, knee, one leg. There's the other one bent right there. Trying to dig its way through the surface exactly as I described. That's where it died. I think it's dead. I think it's a fossil. But it got this exposed to the surface to the point where we can see clearly two leg-like structures with bent knees, right? And then the full head popped through the surface. I think that's pretty amazing. I like this one here even better than this one here. I like this one here even better than this one here. And I'm going to show you why in a moment. Let's look at this. So these are at least two heads side by side, broken at the base of the neck right here for the bigger one. Little, literally ripped from its body and laying on the surface of Mars. Whoops, I had auto adjusted the color there. Let me do the brightness. Well, I guess I can do the color and then the brightness and contrast here. Um, auto adjust, no, okay, never mind. Can't find what I want right there, um, but that's fine. Maybe this is what I've been doing. Anyhow, notice the shape right here. Nostril, lower jaw, mouth, mouth, nostril, eye, ear area. This here is a head. It goes back. This is part of the uh, base of the neck of this head over here. There is another creature's head lying right next to it at a slightly different angle. Lower jaw. Nostril area, mouth right here, mouth, nostril, lower jaw, eye area. So there's a head right here. Both are torn off from their bodies at the base right here. Two heads lying stacked against each other, exposed on Mars surface. Here's the same thing, different enlargements. Just sitting there for the rover to photograph not rocks. This geometry, especially right here, you couldn't explain as a rock if you tried in nature through ge just geologic processes. You combine it with the rest of this, you're looking at exposed flash fossilized fossils right. of at least two creatures. And this is not great, but it is interesting. There's a head that's coming through the surface right here. 
This is the mouth and you've actually got the teeth right here, upper, lower, hard to see at this magnification if I automatically adjust it. And you have some of the pink gum line right here. The color is preserved in the fossil, partially decayed, but the gum line exposed here, sets of teeth. This is the body right here, part of the creature's head. This is the thing I'm outlining it. This thing over here is a different head, different creature. So this is the head partially exposed to the surface. Just showed it because it popped up. I want to get to better stuff. Um, so this is interesting. You might be tempted to think this is just an unusual pile of rocks, the way it's broken up here, right? Except it isn't. I've got something similar from to it, similar to this, exposed on the surface of an asteroid. Meaning this is a repeating fossil right here. That's the upper head, the lower part. I don't know if those are scales or that's just how it broke up when it fossilized, no idea. But there's something almost identical to it sitting on the surface of an asteroid that NASA also photographed. So I thought that was worth capturing. This is another fossil in the background. Bent knee right here, exposed leg, head, partially exposed in the background. It's actually quite in the distance in the background. But this is how it appears to the rover. I thought that was interesting. I'm gonna show a better one that I shared with William White Crow in a bit. This is a fossil I've shared with a copyrighted text across it. Online now, I've shared it for years, but here it is. Exposed to the surface of Mars, lying on a rock, actually. Right here, popped through the surface, this is a fossil. Yeah, and if you look at it from a distance, the difference in coloration of this versus what's around it makes it look pretty bizarre. All right. This doesn't look like much, but it's actually one of my favorites, and I'm going to show you why. So notice the symmetry in this, Alfred, right here? Right. You've got left and right symmetry here. Perfect left and right symmetry. It is a fossil, or some people might argue artificial, ar artificial object. It's one of a class of highly angular fossilized heads. Mm. On Mars surface is the class that's different from what we find on Earth. How do I know that this is a head and not an artificial object? Well, I'm going to prove it here in a moment. But for the moment, notice the symmetry here. And this plate that goes across the top, right? Mm -hmm. People could look at that. And if they really study, they could say, OK, maybe that's a carved object because of this symmetry here. They might look at this and say, well, that's kind of weird. I don't understand this break here. And Where'd this chunk go right here, right? They might wonder about that if they're thinking it's a rock or something artificial. Here's the problem. This part right here, you see this? Hmm. That's an eye. Right. There's the pupil hmm. right there. There's the sclera, if you will. This is a head plate over the exposed eye. Hmm. You're seeing the upper portion of the head right here. The lower portion is buried. The, the lower jaw hmm. is not photographed and it's buried. This is actually an eye hmm. on the side of this thing right here. This is a fossilized head. One of the strange categories I mentioned. Try having a geologist explain this. If they're honest, they will not be able to do that. Okay. I like this one. I don't love it, but I do like it. Notice how different, and I'm not the first person, by the way, to see this. I might be the first person to notice a couple of details in it that I'm going to point out. This is jutting straight to the surface of Mars, right? Totally different in color from the background. People might look at that and think, boy, that's a weird looking set of rocks, and why is it so... I don't know, uh, mud ball looking, if you want to say that. Broken up right here, right? So rough. 
you might look at that and you might look at this pointy part up here and think, well, that this part here is especially a little strange on top of that, right? A little angular. You might look at that and you might think, boy, what in the world could that be? And just dismiss it after thinking about it, right? The problem is this piece right here. You see this, what I'm circling? You know, bones are hollow, right? And if you break a bone and you catch it at the right angle, it's gonna look just like this. Hmm. A little round and there's the part where the uh, center of the bone would be. It looks to me as though, and I'm not gonna say definitively on this one, but it looks to me as though this is a broken bone jutting out of the surface of whatever this thing is. And I actually think this also is a fossilized head or a fossilized body part sticking up through the surface. Hmm. But this part is tubular and probably a broken bone sticking through the surface. Would I you know, wager a bet on that? No, probably not. That's just what I think. All right, this here is uh, pretty stunning, actually. Fully exposed on Mars surface. And, and again, these are average. I do have better things that'll be in the books and I'm gonna show some better things before we're done here. This is the top or bottom, I don't know which it is. Half of a creature, half of it is missing, okay? It's all decayed and, and eaten away, maybe consumed and rotted away, whatever, worn away where I'm <clears throat> moving the mouse across, right? You wouldn't know what this is if all you could see is the part across which I'm moving my mouse. You can see that there's a line basically, right? That this is a formation of some sort, right? There's something about it that's unusual, right? But when you look at this left part over here, and you know this part is joined to this, right? It's, it's worn away through this section here. This part right here, is part of a head. And that's easy to prove when you enlarge it a little bit and change the color a little bit. Let's take a look at what happens when we just have a little bit better view. Notice this patterning here. You see this? Where I'm drawing the mouse right here? Right. This patterning right here. And it repeats, by the way over here. You can't see most of it over here, but you can see this portion of it. In other words, what we see right here actually repeats over here. So the symmetry here tells us this is the top portion of a head or a lower portion, it's one or the other. And the other part is missing. And as we're looking at a carcass, mostly worn away, but enough of the head preserved right here to see that this isn't just a rock. It's some sort of a fossil. You see that right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's another thing jutting through the surface of Mars. Others have seen this one. I find this one intriguing. I don't know if it's an insect or what it is, but I think it's some sort of a fossilized structure, these things sticking through the surface. This particularly is not an ordinary rock. There's enough symmetry preserved here to suggest that looks like some sort of insectoid fossil or something like it sticking through the surface. All right. I think these are pretty stunning. I wish they were bigger and in higher resolution right here. What I'm gonna show you here. What you're seeing here, and that's not color adjusted. Let me adjust it just a little bit. Not great resolution because it's actually from a good distance. But these are the eye areas. What you see here is a pink tongue. The right. nose, the eyes, the tongue is sticking out. It's actually preserved. On this fossil, there's the head with the tongue. Do you have I, any, <laughs> any, any concept of the scale on that one? I don't. I haven't uh -huh. taken the time to look. I, do know where it is, and at some point I can try to figure that out. Right. This one right here is about the same scale as this one right here. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. So if we didn't have this part right here, I wouldn't think a whole lot of this, but what you're actually looking at here is 
a shark-like head, shark-like in the sense that you've got serrated teeth, upper and lower right here that are exposed in an open mouth, in a fossilized head. So not very obvious unless you look closely, okay? But what you can see, which is obvious, is this line right here and this line right here and the V-like opening right here, right? And what could be a, a head-like shape, maybe right there, and a lower jaw, maybe right there. What intrigued me about this one is the teeth, right? And by the way, I have some excellent examples of fangs and teeth. These are not those that I'll be showing in different fossils. This is just a set that I happen to have handy to go over with you. But to me, this is some sort of shark-like head that was fossilized, exposed on Mars surface where enough was preserved of the teeth to see some upper and lower teeth remnants. All right, now I wanna show you some pretty stunning things besides what I have. All right, this is actually one of my favorites right here. We've all seen Roadrunner and birds like that on Earth, right? In cartoons. Uh -huh. This is a fully exposed left side of a head on Mars surface. If I adjust it a little bit, this was just an automatic adjustment, so I'm not doing anything fancy right here if I undo that. This is how NASA photographed it, okay? I can make it larger or smaller, right? And we can go through different uh, enlargements of the same thing. Mm. And in fact, you can actually see it's in the same image with this one right here. Right. They're adjacent to each other. Mm. You see how different their colors are? Mm -hmm. No editing. That's how NASA photographed it. So let's look at that head, what happens when we adjust this a little bit. Uh, you're looking at a beak right here. This is the eye, the back of the head, a little bit like a pterodactyl, but this isn't a pterodactyl. The lower jaw is curved upward. The upper jaw is curved upward. You see the crease where the mouth is, right? The mouth is closed, the eye area, the back of the head, part of the neck. And when you look at it like this, it's fairly obvious that you're looking at a bird-like head, right? Not a rock. And you can see how different the geometry is from between this one and this one, right? This is one of the things, and there are several, but one of the things that makes it impossible for things like this to be formed naturally. Whatever this was subjected to, if it were a rock, let's say, to make this shape geologically, whatever set of ge geologic conditions this experienced, you know, wind, blowing dirt, water, other chemical processes, whatever. This thing here would have been subjected to the exact same processes. They're right next to each other, right? Their shapes are totally different from each other. And the other interesting thing here is notice that they're both, and this, this occurs frequently on Mars as well, they're both kind of uh, pointing almost in the same direction, right? right. Sort of as, if when they, as if when they died, they were observing the same thing. Now, it startled them. Could, could you again hypothesize and put it in perspective? Why do we have the, why is Mars the way it is? And why are these fossilized creatures the way they are? Okay, let me show one other, then I'll answer your question. Then I'll come back and show you a few others. And then I'm going to go past Mars to the moon. Okay. And the comets and asteroids. So we don't neglect to get to those because those are very important. Okay. So this is only a head right here, although the entire side of the creature is exposed. I'm going to show you the rest of it in a moment. Notice the ears. Perfectly pointed and shaped ears. This is the nose area, part of the head. So this is the head, this is the side of the head, okay? Where I'm drawing the mouse, that's the portion that's exposed. 
above surface, okay? Let's look at the rest of it. Let me find it here. I don't have all these uh, together as I would like. Uh, here it is. Same thing, the auto adjust it. Same head we were just looking at. Here's the rest of the body right here. This is the front of the body, part of the chest. Going to the back, part of a leg gets cut off here. Part of the legs right here cut off. So what you can see here is a little portion of the legs, the main portion of the body on the, uh, I suppose the left side of the creature, its head bent. So in other words, it died and it keeled over lying on its right side and fossilized like this. You see it? The ears are the giveaway. You don't get two ears like this along with the rest of the symmetry from rocks. Can't happen in nature, not through natural processes. Either it's carved, it's artificial, or this is grown and it flash fossilized, turned to stone, just like the notosaur on Earth. But fully exposed, you didn't have to dig it out. All right. So let me show you um, some others. Okay, so here's another head. I told you there's a whole bunch of these on Mars, right? And they're offered, often differ, often uh, different. Notice the symmetry and coloration here. This one's coloration was preserved to the flash fossilization. So it's a little bit lighter right here than the rest of it. But notice these lines right here, okay? There's left and right symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is what we would call it. So here's the back of the head, the front of the head, the nose area, okay? You don't see the mouth open on this, not enough is preserved to see that, but you see the head-like shape. And what really gives it away is the bilateral symmetry here. And there's some coloration preserved. This is one that I particularly like. You know what snails and slugs look like on Earth, right? Okay, so this is a fully preserved portion of a creature. Very snail or slug-like. Here are the two antenna-like protrusions right here. Hard to see in this image, but here they are. The head, the mouth is closed, the eye area, and part of the neck goes back into this and you can't see any more beyond that. But if I adjust this to make it more visible, you'll see that this resembles quite a bit a slug or snail-like creature from the left side. That's on Mars, just sitting there exposed. And if I make it smaller, you can see it a little bit better. Not a great one, but it was interesting enough to share. Um, and, okay. As I said, some things are incredibly colorful on Mars, right? This is like the striations on the beak of the uh, pterosaur we saw. Totally different uh, sort of creature and head though. So this is the head right here. Not a very good one, not especially easy to see. What you can see is the transition and the coloration from this half right here to this half. And then the coloration is darker across the top. You might argue that could happen in nature, except I have a bunch of them just like it, showing that it's a repeating pattern. Okay, this is a group of fossils that's pretty stunning. Highly colorful. So this is without any adjustment to the colors on Mars. What I wanna show you here is, uh, is this area right here from up here to these right here where I'm drawing the mouse. Fully exposed, just adjusted it a little bit. So follow with me here, the eyes, the nose, this is a head right here. I'm circling it with a mouse. There's a nostril, there's a nostril, there's an eye. There's an eye, this is a head. Just down here, here's another head, totally different creature. Nostril, where I have the mouse pointer. The mouth, okay, that's the upper jawline, the lower jawline, 
part of the body back here decayed but colorful right here okay this is another head next to it not that easy to see but it is in this combination easy to see that these are not just rocks you're looking at relatively decayed fossils exposed on mars surface with enough preserved of at least three heads to realize you're looking at heads between this one this one and this one so let's look at just this one right here. I was just showing you that a moment ago on the upper left. You see the head? Nostrils, eyes, part of a head. Let me undo that adjustment. Not adjusted, okay? We could easily adjust this. You know, somebody who's better at this than me could make it much more obvious to see the details in this. That's one example. Um, I particularly like this one. This is an almost dragon-like head. I'll show you why I like this when I auto adjust it. This one is mostly encased in rock. So if you look at this closely, you see the outline right here, right? An indentation basically right here. This is an ear, over here's an ear and it's just kind of covered a little bit by dirt that turned to rock. This is the lower jaw, the upper jaw, the nose area. This is an eye right here. Let me undo the adjustment so you can see it better. You know, an Irfan view is a fairly primitive program, so its adjustments are not great. Sometimes it helps us, other times not. It's easy to do better adjustments with different programs. This is just a defect. You know, NASA took this actually in two images. So this is a half and this is a half, and this is where they, where the two halves were put together you know, in a panorama. So there's a little break up across this, unfortunately, so it's not a perfect image. But notice the eye area, the ears, the almost reptilian-like look to it. And if I make it smaller, if you don't over enlarge it, it becomes more obvious that this is a head, right? Some of the color preserved. Okay. So I'll show this. I will say this too. Let me show this right here. I might have not bothered to share this were it not for the fact that I found something identical to it also mm -hmm. on a comet. So you see this portion right here? Mm -hmm. You see these vertical lines, evenly right. spaced right. right here across this portion that's horizontal. Yes. If all we had to look at was this, we could pretty easily dismiss it and say, that's a little weird. Yeah, you know, maybe it's a rock, probably it's a rock. I don't know exactly how that formed, but yeah, I'm gonna dismiss that as a rock. Even though the coloration is off here, the problem is I found something identical to this with the exact same pattern uh, exposed on the surface of a comet. Whoa. And this is on Mars. Whoa. So you got two of the same thing, whatever this is, on Mars and on a comet. All right, I do love this one, but unless your your mind is allowing you, it won't make sense immediately. Hmm. When I explain it, it will make perfect sense. So this, I'll just tell you what this is. This is the decayed body right here. Easy to dismiss as just rocks and ignore. Mm -hmm. This might be a fossilized head jutting into it with the two eye areas. I don't know, wouldn't ever hang my head on it. But this part right here, mm -hmm. If you adjust the color in a different program to get better adjustment, and I'll just take away the adjustment here for a moment. This is unadjusted. Right. Let's outline the shape here with the mouse. Follow my mouse, curved right here. Right. right. Curved right here and darker at this point than it is between here and here, right? Right. Kind of like you'd see on a nose or a lip. Going back, what you're looking at here is actually the top of a head. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at right here is the neck yeah. extending behind right. it to the base right. of the body. Oh, and the body yes. is all worn away. Oh, yes, I can see that. So the worn away body, the neck, and the top of the head. Right. And if I auto adjust it, a little more obvious. Right? Right. Yeah. Not sure. a rock. When you get a pattern like that, yeah. Not a rock. And if you make it a little darker here, small enough to where it's not obscuring the patterns, mm -hmm. you can see the two nostrils here, 
and right, hit. Right. And that's one of the amazing things about these, right? When you first notice these, uh, your mind might let you go past it, but when you think, could that be head? As soon as you start wondering, okay, if it is a head, then it should have eyes, nostrils, ears, right? If you look in the general area where you might expect those things to be, if it were like a terrestrial creature, quite often you'll find that that's exactly where they are and they are actually there, even though they weren't obvious initially. Not a rock. If it was just a rock, you'd look for it and it wouldn't be there. Right. And certainly not where you're expecting it to be. So, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> there are just a great many others uh, everywhere. And I won't take too much more time on these because I do want to get the comments and asteroids. Right. So what I want everyone to understand is what I'm sharing here. These are average examples, most of them, not all of them. I mean, this is, it's not greatly focused, but because of what's shown in it, it's not average. Okay. These two heads, side by side, not average, right? Let's look at this one here. This is another head that's looking straight up. The mouth is open on this one. So here's the mouth, it's open. Lower mouth, nose area, upper part of the head. And then you've got this strange thing coming down right here on the side. I don't know what that is, if that's another fossil, but it doesn't fit with the geometry of this and certainly not with these things all being rocks. And if we make this a little bit smaller, you can sort of see the nostril right here, right? Mm -hmm. The eye area right here. This might be some sort of antler thing, some sort of other fossil. I've got no idea actually what that is, but it's, I don't know if it's part of the same fossil, but this part is a head mm -hmm. with the open mouth. I liked it only because it's got this over here. I thought that made it interesting. There are a lot of better heads, you know, so some I show because I find them interesting personally mm -hmm. <clears throat> and others because they're actually a pretty big deal. So, um, I want to show you some more bird-like heads because there are quite a few others exposed on Mars surface. I've got another one that I particularly like in this set. So I'm just looking for it. Here it is. Everybody's seen Big Bird on Sesame Street, right? Right. Think of how Big Bird's head beak looks, right? The head of Big Bird and its beak. Mm -hmm. Here it is on Mars. Right. Something very similar. Hmm. You auto adjust it. We were to sharpen the focus a little bit here, we'd see the beak. And you can see where it changes the transition does the coloration from the rest of the head. Exactly as you'd see on a bird's beak on earth, right? You can't see the lower part of the mouth really but you can kind of make out that that looks like a beaked head from the side, partially exposed on Mars surface, right? right? We look at it at different magnifications. If it were just a rock, and I would not argue that it probably was if this right here was the same color as the rest of all this, but it's just what you'd expect from a beak, right? And if you auto adjust it, it becomes more obvious that it's what you would expect from a beak. Particularly if you sharpen it and enlarge it, which I haven't done. So I like that one because it reminds me of Big Bird. This is another beaked head right here. Let me show this one. So just look at it as I go zooming in a little bit. This is not uh, a very obvious one. If you, enlarge, if you um, auto adjust it, you can see it. <clears throat> Let me just do the big part to auto adjust it, see if it's a little better to see. All right, so hard to see once it's enlarged, but if you make it a little bit smaller, let's go in here. Anyway, it's part of a head from the side. It's not a great one, but I believe it's beaked. Right. And I like it because it's in the background with this one. 
Okay. Now they're not yeah. far from each other. <clears throat> now I just want to get this straight. Are you saying that the Martian cataclysm was at the same time as the as the great flood on Earth? Immediately before it. It takes some time for comets and asteroids to transition from Mars to Earth or to, or to transition from a planetary body that exploded, you know, and pelted the solar system in all directions oh. between Mars and Jupiter. Oh. Oh, and then I for the, the debris, for the debris to reach and strike Mars. Oh, I see. And then keep going and reach and strike our moon and reach and strike Earth. I, I see. Okay. But it's but so there was a so so it was the and and what caused, according to your view, what caused the pulverization of Tiamat of that particular planet of the God. Scripture explicitly tells us that God caused the flood. He did it. That uh, of that planet, of that original planet. Uh, everything that caused Noah's flood on Earth, all yeah. of it, God did it. And okay. the evidence suggests to me, well, and the evidence just suggests, and scripture agrees that Earth was pelted. In other words, the windows of heaven opened, right? Mm -hmm. The pillars beneath that supercontinent were shattered and the supercontinent was crushed, or the, the continent was shattered, I should say, and the Right. The pillars beneath it were crushed and it sunk down, changing our angular momentum as I described. But for that kind of cataclysm to occur on Earth, right, and to destabilize the planet's crust as it did, and to allow water to come up from beneath that crust, not just to pour down from above from that collapsed water vapor canopy, Earth had to be struck pretty substantially. And it was. And we can look, in fact, at the moon. There's, a, there's an impact on the moon that is so huge that that uh, there's a big chunk of an asteroid that's quite large right, buried right. just beneath the surface of the moon. Now, you're looking at all these signatures. What comparable signatures would you point to of the great flood on Earth? Um, everything on Earth was wiped. The surface was almost wiped clean. You know, it was a clean slate in a sense. And what I mean by that is a lot of the stuff that was present is buried under sediment to this day, like pyramids. Whole pyramids are buried beneath the sands of Egypt's desert right now. Buried between, uh, for example, um, Cuba and the United States on the ocean's surface, under the water. There are pyramidal structures right now between yes. Cuba and the United States on the ocean surface. What was on the Earth's surface, in other words, before the flood, a lot of it got buried. Some of it didn't. The pyramids at Giza got, you know, inundated with water. So there's seashells and all that, but the water receded. And then those pyramids were reused, reoccupied, if you will, by humans, in this case, the ancient Egyptians, post-flood. And they claimed, you know, that they built it when in fact they didn't build those structures. And those pyramids are different from a lot of the others in Egypt because they don't have the same hieroglyphs inside them. They're, they're mostly a blank slate inside, actually. Uh, they're, they're different in various ways. Than a lot of the other pyramids in Egypt. So, and then the Sphinx is there, right? And people look at all the um, the wear and tear around the base of the Sphinx, and they think that the desert sands did that. A lot of people do over time, but we now know scientifically that water did that. That the Sphinx was inundated in water, and that and that what we're seeing there is uh, the wearing away of water around the Sphinx. And then the head of the Sphinx was recarved from a lion's head to a pharaoh's head later, post-flood. So, so that's what we can say about the Sphinx. The Sphinx itself is a pre-flood object. You know, it's been weather-worn through the flood. It, the water receded, and then somebody carved its head away to change it from a lion to a pharaoh's head, basically part of it. That's the Sphinx. There's a lot of stuff buried beneath uh, the surface of the earth from the pre-flood civilizations on earth, including some technological artifacts. So, and that's all over the earth. It's not just in Egypt, the surface of the earth, much of it has that. Uh, and then in a lot of areas too, things literally got flipped. Kind of like you see in uh, that movie 2012, you know, our whole section to crust were, were flipped and just, the surface of the planet was remade in a sense, right? But with the flood, those who were aboard the ark were able to survive I on see. that 
water. And then when the waters receded, the surface of the planet was largely changed, not entirely so. So they knew, for example, where the mountains of Ararat were, right? And where Israel is today is actually in scripture called the navel of the earth, where Jerusalem sits in scripture is explicitly called the navel of the earth or the center of the earth. A lot of people think the center of the earth is where the pyramids are today on Giza, the Giza platform, the Giza plateau. They think that's where the, uh, the geological longitudinal and latitudinal center of the earth is. It's originally right where Jerusalem sits today. And there's a lot to that. I go into it in my books. I don't have time for it here, but the point is, Earth's surface was dramatically changed with the flood, but not completely. Some things were re-exposed, others remain buried. Others are so buried, we'll never ever see them again. And, uh, and then a thousand years from now, a little more than a thousand years from now, this planet that we live on today is going to be completely replaced by a brand new larger one for the end of the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament. So what we see today will go away as well. But, um, and in fact, our whole solar system is going to be replaced when that time comes. Supernaturally, just like that, same way God made the universe initially when he spoke it into existence, a little more than a thousand years from now, he's going to replace this planet and our solar system with one that's not damaged, that doesn't have what the Nephilim did to it in it anymore, because it'll all be gone. In other words, a clean slate, a completely habitable new solar system. And he will undo uh, what the devil did. So, but make things better than even before. So anyway, continuing with that, let's move on. I could go on and on all day with, with comparable and better examples. Uh, I will say this, Alfred, there are thousands minimally of different examples of creature types just on Mars that I can show from the fossils I've got. and a number of very specific categories. So you get creatures that look very, very similar to those on Earth, like the iguana, like these heads that I showed lying on their side that look horse-like, you know, where I'm putting my mouth here, my mouse, that is. You get heads that look relatively terrestrial, you know, pointy ears that look relatively terrestrial. You have teeth and tongues and fangs and lips and jaws and legs and knees and all the rest, just like life on Earth. And then you get into this into a couple of different categories of fossils like these, uh, like this one that I said, there's one identical to it on a comet's surface or um, these highly angular and symmetrical ones like this right here, you know, with bilateral symmetry. Here it is again. Or um, this one that's kind of flat that looks a bit like a, an iron for clothes or this one that looks a bit like a staple remover at, at one end of the, the head or the object, or uh, something like this that could be a terrestrial skeletal part. I just don't know what part of the skeleton it would be. Uh, or this mouth that looks highly terrestrial, sticking through the surface with these darkened lips and nose and so forth. Or uh, the slit eye like this, like you'd see on a reptile. It's an oval eye with a slit in it. The eye looks pretty terrestrial, or the tongue on this little thing here that looks like a fairly terrestrial kind of tongue, or the jagged teeth on this one that look like a bit like you'd see on a shark, perhaps. Um, and I haven't shown a lot of these, but or rogue teeth like this, right? Or a head with an ear like this and a thick neck that sticks to the surface looks relatively terrestrial. But then you get into other things. Um, like this, highly different from anything we've seen on Earth. Highly angular, right? And I'm gonna say that's a head. I know it's a head because I'll have a lot of others just like it that I found. And if people want to know, yes, I have multiple, of exam multiple examples of identical fossils at different points on Mars photographed by the same and by different rovers. I will point that out as well. In other words, there's repetition of some of these creature types, these fossil types. I will point that as, out as well in the Solar Apocalypse series. Um, so all that being said, I could go on literally for days with this uh, just on Mars, literally with thousands of examples, superior examples to these and comparable examples to these. 
But what I've shown here is more than enough to convince those knowledgeable, and there are a lot of people who aren't, who think they are, who are arrogant enough to say, that's not what Tim says it is. Well, you can listen to those people if you want. I'll tell you, they don't know science as much as they think they do. They aren't as knowledgeable as they think they do, uh, as they think they are, about archaeology, paleontology, biology, uh, data science, et cetera, as I am. I'm telling you, that's what these things are. And people who are actually knowledgeable in these fields, particularly a combination of them, will agree with me when they see these things. So I've shown you enough proof. Certainly NASA would know these things are proof, though they won't admit it publicly. So that's just Mars. And I did recall, let's come back to this. And I need to come back to it anyway. Can you see my screen here with a slideshow again? <laughs> yes, it says the impossible creature okay. size. So I did in this show some pretty awesome examples, like this, this mandible head, right? Right. I think that's an awesome example. This is one of my all-time favorites, but I have some others, where you see the whole side of a creature with a, a jointed shoulder and the folded leg and the amphibian-like mouth. You can see it's a chimeric hybrid, in other words, Alfred. And right. the head on this thing, if you see the, the, the best examples I have, which I'll be showing in the books, and giving people the ability to independently verify them in the solar apocalypse series. The head on this is staggeringly ornate and it's bony and it's perfect, perfect uh, bilateral symmetry on this thing. On this bony, uh, I call it a crown, crown-like thing atop its head. But the forehead and the shape of this head suggests it's got a big brain potentially. It might be as intelligent as you and I when it was alive. This is not a dumb creature, most likely. And its eyes, you know, serrated lips. So instead of teeth, it's eating with a serrated lip. And then ostensibly folded wings back here, surrounded by other creatures and, you know, this box-like thing in the background, right? These are, this is a pretty great head right here, and I'm not going to show that, but there are other fossils here that are actually pretty great in the background, like this thing right here, sticking up to the ground, but nothing compares to this right here. I love that one. And there are others. So I just want to remind people those are there. So there's better stuff coming in the books. You know, like this dinosaur's head here. I love this one. You know, I really think it's impressive because of the red eye here, exactly like you'd see on some reptiles on earth, where, they're, where the coloration around their eye socket and their eyes is different. It might be bright red or some other bright color that differs from the rest of the head and face. You can see the angles on this. Let me point this out just for a moment here, Alfred. When people look at things like this and they want to suggest, for example, some want to say that's just part of this hill, right? They want to say that's just rock sticking out from the side of the hill. Somebody who uh, is ignorant, I'll call them ignorant, and might try to make that argument. Here's part of the problem with attempting to make uh, that sort of an argument. When we look at this right here, you'll notice that this line is perpendicular more or less to the side of this hill-like structure right here, this line. This one's perpendicular to this. These are parallel right here, but they go in multiple lines that you would see curved here, perpendicular more or less here, nose-like structure here, perfect eye-like structure here, and the colors are adjusted there, so it kind of takes away from it a little bit. A little more obvious here, with the colors not adjusted. And anyway, I just want to point out the angles of some of these things and the shapes do not work if you want to argue that geologic processes produced this right here. Likewise, the opening right up here, where you've got, if I were to blow this up, and trace this, you see this right here? It's actually like shaped like a V, almost, with the eyes right here and an almost rounded head. And it's breaking up a little bit because I'm enlarging it too much for this slide on this show, but right here is a, a fossil that's exposed in the surface. One of the things I point out in the solar apocalypse series is you've got paleontologists literally every day of the year, somewhere in the world, 
pointing out a fossil that's exposed on the surface of the earth or some fossil that they've discovered and showing a photo of it. And nine times out of 10, what they're showing is inferior to this thing that I'm moving my mouse across. And they're saying, that's a fossil. And you know, unless they were paleontologists, most people wouldn't believe them. They'd look at that and they'd say, I don't see what you see right there, right? Those same paleontologists would immediately recognize something like this as a fossil. They would immediately recognize this as something they can't explain as just a rock if they're honest. This thing right here, this head. So I just want to point that out and then let's move on. And then of course, the same would be true of this. Look at the shape right here. Notice that this is oval and it's flat. It's flat here and it's oval here. This is angular here. It's not oval, but it is flat here, right? And then it's segmented here and it goes upward. Again, angular here, different angles. Again, another segment here. This here is angular, but it's curved right here, right? This is segmented. Here's one segment curved right there, flat right here, curved right here. Another segment right here, a little bit harder to see that segment, but geometrical. Another segment that goes up right here, comes back here, goes over here, part of a leg, hard to see. But my point is when you combine this geometry, this segment with this segment, with this segment, with this very angular segment, if all somebody could see was this portion of the image right here, this little rectangular portion, any honest, intelligent person, including a geologist would look at that and say, that's an artificial structure, it's been carved, somebody put it there, somebody molded it, or it's a fossil if they were to look at it in the context of the rest of this right here, particularly in the context of this heart-shaped or mantid-shaped head with the depression for the two eyes, the nose-like portion right here, the opened mouth right here, positioned exactly where you'd expect it to be on a body-like structure that's segmented like this right here, and above these leg-like structures here. You understand what I'm saying? When people look at the combination of the geometry, if they're honest and they're actual scientists and they really know their stuff, they will immediately know. They're not looking at just rocks. They might be looking at fossils, but they're not just rocks produced by simple geology. They're either rocks produced by fossilized creatures or they're artificial structures. They're one or the other. Either way, you're talking about intelligent life on Mars minimally in the past. Okay. So let's move on and let me show you. Let me remind you, by the way, we saw this thing from orbit on Mars, right? Still with me, Alfred? Oh, I'm right here. <laughs> okay. I'll make sure I'm not losing you. So quiet. Yeah, no, I okay. it, it's it's because you're you're giving us the show here. And, uh, you know, I come in with my strategic questions. All right. Well, this is one of the most stunning things. In fact, I will say it is the most stunning thing most people have ever seen in their life. What I'm about to show you. Now, this probably would have been it until the next slide right here to suggest that there could be a Titan-sized creature that tends, you know, that's tens of miles well, in length. Well, well, well we've Such a thing done could have ever this. Existed. Yeah, we've, we've done this, this slide, right? We have, but yeah. I, again, I want to say that's pretty stunning, isn't it? And even JPL looked at that and they didn't know what to make of it. They were so jaw dropped by this that they said that looks like a creature. But then of course they know that the photo is from orbit, that the thing is tens of miles long and they weren't willing to say any more than that. And they weren't willing to go public about it because well, they thought they'd look like idiots because who can call something that size a creature, right? How do you explain it? See, those guys know something about orbital science and taking pictures. But the truth is most of the people at NASA are actually not very knowledgeable scientists. They know a little bit about their area. They've got fantastic engineers. So I don't wanna ding those people, but most of the ones dealing with biology, exobiology, paleontologists, they do not know their stuff like they should. And they aren't multidisciplinary scientists. So they don't have enough knowledge of enough areas to look at something like this and draw proper conclusions about what they're seeing. 
So instead they get scared, perhaps they look at this and say, gosh, th that looks a little bit like a creature, but their brains won't let them go any further about, you know, than that and try to explain it or anything else. And they don't show it, for example, to uh, people who might be experts on reptiles and say, what do you make of that? What do you think that is? Does that look like scales to you? Right? They don't go that far. They ignore it after they make their explanation. It looks like a creature. And to be honest with you, that's the most incredible explanation I think anybody from NASA or JPL has made about any photograph, orbital or on the surface, that they've taken to date was what they said about this photo. So I just want to point that out. And most people have never seen this photo, right? What I'm going to show you next blows this one away. Okay? okay. I've suggested this might be a Titan. That's what I'm suggesting. And I'm being honest about the fact that I can't explain this. I can try. And by the way, I have made a valiant effort to explain how that sort of a Titan, something that size, could have existed in nature and been alive at one time, thousands of years ago. I made a very valiant effort in the Solar Apocalypse series to make a credible, to offer a credible explanation of how something like that might exist. Okay. I'm going to say it's either an artificial structure, in which case, who would build something like that, right? Seems kind of insane. Or it is exactly what it looks like. It is a partially exposed, uh, scaly part of a giant, unimaginably large creature. It's one of those two things. All right, so that's on Mars. Here is a comet. You see this? Are you seeing this, Alfred? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm seeing in front of me, and okay. um... let me tell you what you're looking at. So, everything around this, except for this part right here, is pretty dark, right? Mm -hmm. This is unedited. This is natural light. It's unedited. This thing is completely different in color, right? Mm -hmm. Other than this over here. What you're seeing here is about 30 feet in length from here to here, mm -hmm. maybe 20 feet from here to here, 15 to 20 feet. Mm -hmm. This is the fossilized head of a reptile sticking through the surface of the comet. Mm. Lower mouth, there's the mouth right there. You can see the crease for the mouth. Right. Lower jaw, right? Flat face, there's the nose. There's one of the nostrils. Mm -hmm. Here's the eye right here. Mm -hmm. The pointy portion over the eye. So here's the eye, the nostril, the flat nose area, the mouth, the lower jaw, part of the neck, the ear area. The, the ear is reset. This is the ear area back here. Could be here, but I actually think that's, that's, that is what this is right here. But in any case, you're looking at a 30-foot sized head sticking through the surface of a comet. And that's how it mm -hmm. died. Froze right there, died. This is another head. In fact, I have thousands of examples of exposed heads, some completely exposed carcasses lying on the surface of comets and asteroids. Legs, necks, teeth in some cases, nostrils. Some of them look exactly like you'd see on Earth, the same as I pointed out on Mars. Others look relatively different. We've never seen a creature on Earth with a head that's 30 feet in size, have we? How could, could you give a scenario of how the, that creature could have gotten onto a comet? Well, yes, I give the actual full explanation in the Solar Apocalypse series. And in fact, when I spoke in 2016 at the Mars Anomaly Research Society, I also gave the explanation there. Okay. So in other words, I've known the explanation for a long time. And I've known about flash fossilized fossils for longer than that. And I've known about this stuff for a long time. I only started to share this in 2018. 2018, in this presentation, is the first time I ever shared this. And that was privately to a small church. Today, this is the first time I'm sharing it publicly to a large audience. Oh, wow. Okay. I have thousands of examples like this. This is one. 
I love this one because the head is fully exposed on one side and you can make out all the body parts of the head, right? You can see the crease of the mouth. You can see the lower jaw, the flattened face. You can see the area of the nose and you can even see the pointy structure right here, curved right here, pointed like a pyramid right here, the shadow for the nostril. You can see the, the eye is horizontal, right? So this is almost vertical. The eye is almost horizontal, like you'd expect on a creature's head. You got the pointy part for the eye right here on the left side. But by the way, and I don't think you can probably see it very easily on this photo. If you look in the background right here, you see where I'm drawing the circle? Right, right. here. That's the pointy part of the other eye from the other side. Okay. In other words, you can see that the structure for the other eye is in the background here, but there's too much shadowing to make it out. Then there's the rest of the head on this side right here. Okay, but this is unedited. There's zero adjustment from me or uh, anybody else on this right here. That's the way it was photographed. And this was not taken by NASA, by the way. This photo was taken by the European Space Agency. Mm -hmm. So this is an ESA photo of one of the comets they photographed. That same comet has thousands of examples like this of exposed heads next to their... Even snakes, you know, almost snake-like creatures slithering out with their body exposed over the surface of the comet and the head exposed, and they just died right there and fossilized in place with a shadow under them. Even things like that photographed. In other words, they made their way to the surface like this creature did, to the surface of the comet, and just died right there. Died in place, froze in place. So the fossils that I talked about, they're flash fossilized on Earth and on Mars. That's a particular kind of flash fossilization, and it's, it's induced through chemicals and bacteria and water at specific temperature ranges, and it happens very rapidly, okay? Where those things are actually turned to stone, like that notice store on Earth was, and had to be chiseled out. There are other kinds of fossils that I've not mentioned. We mentioned that type, and then we mentioned bones, right? Like we commonly see on Earth, and by the way, I am showing skeletons also on Mars and not just the flash fossilized variety, which is all that I focused on in today's interview, but there are actually exposed skeletons on the surface of Mars, just like the skeletons in our museums on earth of dinosaurs and other creatures. I skipped those because to me, I find flash fossilized fossils way more interesting, but I am gonna show actual skeletons uh, on Mars. And some people have found those. I'm not the only one to find some of those. There are other people who found some of those and shared them publicly. If you go look on the internet, you'll find some examples that others have shared. That being said, nobody has seen this photo before or had it pointed out until today. And that little church I showed it to in 2018. So here's the explanation. Uh, and, and by the way, let me say this one froze in place. It didn't flash fossilize. If you could take this thing off the comet and thaw it out, uh, without having the thing just disintegrate, right? Like uh, something that's subjected to liquid nitrogen and then thawed. That's the kind of freezing, we're, freezing that we're talking about, right? Where something is suddenly exposed to the cold of space and just freezes almost as instantly and as comparably as being suddenly plunged into liquid nitrogen would do to the thing. Does that make sense? Because yeah. space is at almost, it's close to absolute zero, right? Right. That's how quickly this thing froze in place. Mm. So if you could take that thing, dig it out, thaw it very slowly, you'd probably have flesh on your hands if it didn't just fracture and break apart. Mm. You know, something that had been so long frozen in space that it had been completely desiccated. In other words, all the moisture just sucked right out of it. You know, as it had been frozen in space and, and desiccated, exposed to the vacuum of space. Because of the volume inside that thing, I imagine there's probably a lot of frozen ice inside of it still, meaning the water from its cells. And in that case, you might get some flesh out of it, maybe some DNA, I don't know. But regardless, it's not rock. That thing is frozen in place. It was, flat. It was frozen by cold suddenly, not by flash fossilization. So how did it get there? When the planetary body, which was densely populated between Mars and Jupiter, was exploded by God, destroyed by God, and it might have been more than one, but at least one, 
all those creatures that were on the surface of that body were suddenly ejected into space along with debris from the surface, right? In chunks. In other words, they weren't all loosely expelled. In many cases, the whole volume almost of comets or asteroids were expelled as partially loose, you know, loose end debris into space, including chunks of the surface of that planetary body, which was populated, right? And with that expulsion and the events accommodating it, a lot of creatures would have suddenly been buried in the process of that expulsion into space. Others would have remained exposed. I don't know what's going on with my computer there, but let me ignore that. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay, I didn't know if my headset died. If it does, then uh, yeah, I'll replace no, no, it with a wired headset. It's, it's fine. Okay, so I don't know what just happened, but at any rate, um, so basically you've got uh, rock, mud, water, what is liquid water initially, uh, creatures that are on the surface of that body as it's being detonated from inside, like exploded internally. Presumably that's how God would have done it, but pardon me, exploded internally. So it just explodes in all directions in the space. And that means that surface portions of the body, uh, which would have been, you know, from our vantage point, pretty large chunks, right? Could have been anywhere from meters to many miles in size. Are you following me? Yes. And on those, on those, and in the middle of those would have been creatures that had been tumbled and mixed in with the debris as well as creatures remaining on the surface of the debris, all ejected into space. And the stuff that was closest together would have, in fact, through gravity over time, clumped further together. Yeah, eventually. Would have taken thousands of years, maybe, well, hundreds of thousands of years probably to do that. I haven't done any math to prove that or to, to validate that. That's just what I think. But they probably right, would have clumped. Right. Well, okay. well, well, you just jumped into another time frame because you said hundreds of thousands of years. No, no, hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but oh, okay, <laughs> hundreds to thousands. So I'm sorry I wasn't clear. Okay, yeah, okay. Forgive me. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but in other words, these things would have all been ejected into space quickly. And these creatures not realizing the ones who had survived to that point, because some would have, right? because they'd have been injected as part of a chunk of the surface of the planetary body, ejected into space. Not realizing what would have happened, not being dead necessarily right away, would have tried to claw their way to the surface, whatever surface they thought they could reach. You know, in the orientation they, they started in, some of them would have reached the surface of wherever they were at that point and suddenly been exposed to the vacuum of space. And like the water and the mud and the rock around them, you know, both the liquid and solid parts, just instantly frozen right there. I mean, almost instantly, right? It mm -hmm. takes a little bit of time for the heat from the surface of that planetary body to just be completely sucked out and to dissipate, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly the smaller one, uh, the larger ones, I mean. But whatever creature, you know, almost irrespective of their size, because they're not that huge, most of them, as soon as they would have reached the surface would have just immediately frozen in place and died. They would have taken their last breath and died right there in whatever posture they reached the surface. Hmm. You know, so this one right here that we're seeing the head, it, its lower body might've been digging, you know, frantically fast enough, you know, to get it as exposed as we're seeing it, but it would have died almost immediately. Okay. And just, just, if you could imagine how horrible it would be for one of us to suddenly be immersed in liquid nitrogen, it's about like that. And the the top part of us, in other words, if we were if we were um, just partially dipped initially in the liquid nitrogen, like say our head and part of our neck, and the rest of our body were, yeah, you know, at I don't know, thirty three degrees Fahrenheit, whatever, right? It would be a pretty miserable death and a pretty quick one, but our lower body might be doing something for a little bit of while, just long enough to expose that head a little bit more, in this mm -hmm. case, to the vacuum of space. Now, I'm just 
I've, I've given a better, more, co more coherent explanation, you know, a pretty detailed one right. in the solar apocalypse series. But what I want to explain is that we had creatures ejected with debris, meaning the rock, the mud, the ice, the dirt, the bacteria into space. So on all of these bodies, they're going to be loaded with bacteria. You know, the surface, particularly the fossils that are exposed, there'll be bacteria on their surface in many cases. And what all of these space agencies at this point have reported, meaning the European Space Agency, NASA, and JAX, the Japanese Space Agency, every one of them that has said anything public at this point about the comets and asteroids that they have sampled, where they've done any kind of tests on them, they have all confirmed in, for each of those that there are organics present complex, organic chemicals have been identified, found on those objects. Uh, they have basically all but said they found the same organics that are necessary for DNA on mm -hmm. those objects without calling it DNA. And I've got the citations, the articles, the quotes from the personnel at those agencies in the books already stating those things. And so when we look at these, um, I'm gonna show lots of examples of creatures exposed, fully exposed, more heads than creatures, many more heads than creatures on multiple comets and asteroids. We're talking uh, at this point, I've got them for more than a dozen that have been photographed up close. Uh, and on each of them, a lot of exposed fossils and creatures. So one of the things that NASA said on Bennu, which was one of the more recent ones visited, one of the things that shocked NASA and JAXA was similarly shocked when they went to Ryugu, one of the things that NASA said, and then before that JAXA on those two different comets, is they were shocked by how rough and diverse the surfaces of those bodies were, that they weren't smooth like they'd expect from snowballs, you know, mixed with some, some mud, right, and dirt equivalent to that. They weren't smooth at all. They were incredibly rough, incredibly diverse. And the other thing that they didn't talk a lot about, but they did mention in the case of uh, NASA, is the incredible variety of colors, highly colorful, you know, between the different objects. Can they explain any of that? Did they try? No, I can. The real explanation is that they're looking at all kinds of fossils, partially exposed with their colors intact. You understand what I'm saying? And so yeah. they're also finding organics everywhere. And I'm going to show all kinds of examples of unambiguous heads and other body parts on these comets and asteroids. So here is the problem now for the whole scientific community, right? Obviously, I've created a problem for Christianity, most Christians, because they think, as I used to think, that there can't be anything out there beyond Earth. In our solar system, there can't be complex biology on Mars or our moon or some other body in our solar system, right? Let alone on comets and asteroids. That's not something that Christians in general have thought about or written about or contemplated. And I was completely like that before God started to show me these things. And that's the problem for Christianity. But it isn't really a problem because there's no contradiction, you know, as I've explained with scripture at all. I've explained when these things happened and basically loosely how they happened. Obviously, there's a whole other set of explanations in relation to anti-gravity craft, Nephilim, what they're really doing on Earth, uh, the humanoids who claim to be aliens but are actually related to us genetically, biologically. All that stuff that comes up, you know, people who are interested in UFOs, UAPs, I don't like either of those acronyms. I like uh, UGOs instead, unidentified gravitic objects, which is a better explanation because they go in the sea, they can go in space, they can go in our atmosphere. They're not limited to air or space. At any rate, all that stuff, which I'm not address, addressing um, in this conversation today, I have addressed in detail, including the secret space program stuff in the solar apocalypse series. So I'm not leaving that out. I'm just not talking about it today. You with me? Yep. Okay. So 
here's the issue for the non-Christian. And it's a bigger issue for the non-Christian because they can't explain any of this, period. Every old age solar system model that there is, which comes from macro-evolutionary astrophysics, for example, every cosmological model, every cosmogony that is proposed by astrophysicists and we'll say non-Christians, those who don't literally believe the creation account in scripture. Every one of them starts in the same place, which is that we had gas after a big bang. You know, the big bang was not even the level of matter that we see today initially, but it became that very quickly. And then gas, you know, exploding out into the universe and over time, massive amounts of time, the gas in clusters, you know, it clustered and it began to coalesce very gradually and, and more rapidly as the gravitational forces increased between molecules over a vast amount of time till they got close enough and close enough and close enough and close enough together. And on 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 it goes almost to infinity, it seems, till eventually you get little particles the size of dust. And then it builds up from there to what we might call the size of grains of sand and then little dirt balls and then the size of little rocks, but still incredibly loosely coalesced and just building up from there almost at infinitum till finally you get to something that has enough gravity to form a moonlet, you know, not orbiting anything per se, but that size. And that just keeps going and going and going and going to get something eventually the size of a sun and planetary bodies and then bodies orbiting other bodies like moons, right? All this stuff. And that's a very non-scientific way to try to explain it to the layman, right? To somebody who just has no idea what you're talking about when you start. But basically it's gas. And eventually you get mud balls that might have uh, some moisture like ice, a combination of chemicals, primitive chemicals, right? They're even having a hard time though. They're trying to explain complex organic molecules to which they've admitted at this point in all of these bodies, NASA, JAXA, ESA, have all admitted to complex organics being found in the surfaces of these comets and asteroids that have been closely examined and photographed at this point. They're not denying that. They are trying to offer explanations for how that could come from a so-called primordial soup that was initially just gases. They're stretching things horribly scientifically to try to come up with those explanations, which in reality do not work scientifically in most cases. They'll lie about that to the public just like they've lied to macroevolution from the beginning, you know, ever since Charles Darwin, to try to hoodwink the public, because in general, the public doesn't know better. And many of these so-called scientists actually don't know better themselves. Yeah, at any rate, it's part of the hoodwinking. But if they could get away with all that, let's assume for a moment that they could. Let's even assume for a moment that what they're saying were true. If it were, then the only thing we could ever find in comets and asteroids in this solar system would be mud, rock, ice, dirt, chemicals. You would never find probably bacteria because if you ever found any microbe or bacteria and could prove that that's what you'd found, you would almost certainly have to argue that it floated across space for some unknown period of time, somehow landed on that body. Almost infinitely small mathematical odds that all basically impossible, but somehow it would have happened. And then you happen to land something in that exact spot and sample that exact thing and happen to find it. Even more impossible, mathematically speaking. That's as far as you could ever go with it. And if you wanted to say that the microbe or the bacteria originated on that body, well, then you'd have to show the same sorts of things that they attempt to show in junior high and high school, maybe elementary school, uh, chemistry and biology classes, but usually chemistry to try to say, well, okay, there was some sort of electrical activity here, maybe the equivalent of lightning, uh, across gases, striking some combination of a primordial soup, which might be liquid water somehow, or some sort of ice or whatever, and mixing with this or that chemical, you know, forming some primitive thing that eventually builds up into the most primitive version of RNA or DNA or some basic protein, really, before you get to a protein-like chemical before you get even to DNA, try to say that somehow that could happen through natural processes on a comet or an asteroid. 
even the largest ones, do not have those processes on them. And if any argument could be made, the very largest ones might, might have some sort of liquid, liquid water in their center. And that's if they're not very old and they're relatively close to some body that can keep some sort of gravitational heating occurring in the center of those bodies over the periods of times that astrophysicists and macroevolutions are talking about. So I'm gonna say the weather patterns, the electrical activity, the liquid water, and pretty much anything else that they could try to propose does not exist nor could exist on any of these comets and asteroids, any of them. And because those things don't exist, it's even more impossible for a microbe or a bacterium to exist on those bodies and to have originated in those bodies. Now, if that's true, then it is obviously impossible for complex biology, such as reptiles, like this head that we're seeing right here, of a creature popping out to the surface, or insects or any other complex biological creature to be on any of these bodies. If you find even one on any of these bodies, all of a sudden the entire explanation that astrophysicists, you know, old age solar system and universe astrophysicists propose for the existence of planetary bodies, planetoids. If you find even one such piece example of complex biology on a comet or asteroid, then that object cannot be a building block for planetary bodies as they have claimed they, these things are. Instead, it could literally only Alfred be debris. It could only be debris from a planetary body that had complex life in the past. It couldn't possibly be anything else at all. And then when you find out that all of these comets and asteroids, literally every single one of them that have been visited and photographed up close, and even you can even see it on a lot of them that have been clo uh, photographed close enough with high powered telescopes at this point, but every single one of them that had been photographed up close by multiple space agencies now are covered in fossils, just like Mars surface of complex biological fossils exposed in the surface. When that reality is exposed and people realize that that's true and it can be proven and I do prove it, I do show it's true. I offer a large number of examples that can't be gainsayed or, gainsayed or contradicted in the upcoming solar apocalypse series in a volume that's dedicated only to comets and asteroids. When that is shown to be true, all of the sudden, every model that exists among non-creationists to claim that our solar system, let alone the universe, coalesced from gases, all those models become impossible. Certainly they become impossible for our whole solar system. And because every one of the comets and asteroids in our solar system appears to have the kind of thing that I'm showing right here on this one, which I'm not identifying here, but I will identify in the book. In fact, I'll show exactly where this head is and on what body and who photographed it. All the details will be given and people will be able to independently verify it, just like all the other photos. So in other words, I'm not just gonna show this and say it's there. I'm gonna give people the ability to go verify that it's there directly from the space agencies themselves. So that being said, when they realize that we're only left with one other option and that is special creation, just like scripture proposes and states is true. You can believe the account in the Bible or you can try to go with some other account, but either way you have to go with special creation in terms, in terms of our particular solar system. And of course, I'm gonna say, if the Bible's true on that, it's true on the rest. And when we talk about, and I haven't gotten to the moon yet, but I will in a moment very quickly. I don't need much time for the moon after all of this explanation. But if we accept the account for the Bible, in the Bible, I should say, for our earth and our solar system, why wouldn't we accept that account for the rest of the universe? And when we talk about the so-called Big Bang, yeah, it's true that biblically, God spoke the universe into existence. It's true that biblically, the sequence in which certain objects were formed were contrary to, to anything that any kind of uh, proposed explanation would allow from evolutionists. In other words, uh, in the Bible, the sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day. 
They didn't exist prior to the earth. The earth existed first in the account in Genesis. There were three days in which this planet existed. You know, it was very, uh, very much without form. It was like a ball in space, if you want, of matter, in which, to an extent, initially, in which this planetary body existed without life on it. There were three days in which it existed. And then on the fourth day, the moon was created to orbit this body and the sun was put in place. It was created and put in place and the stars of the universe gave their light. That sequence is ridiculous unless God did it that way intentionally and you believe God. That sequence wouldn't make sense in any model anyone could ever come up with to try to explain a natural origin for the solar system, let alone the universe, right? So here's what I'll say on that. There was no big bang at the beginning in that kind of a sequence biblically. Will there be at the end? In fact, yes, there will be the equivalent to that. Scripture tells us explicitly that there will come a time when God folds up the universe like a garment, as if it were a garment that he was wearing or a cloak or something like that. He draws the analogy of a garment that you can fold up in your hands. There will come a time in the future, the very distant future, presumably, but when God folds up the physical universe and makes a new one, you know, presumably he'll just recreate a brand new universe. That universe, we might argue now with what little we know, with what little scripture does tell us, will probably occur through the equivalent of something like a big bang. And first, of course, God will collapse this universe, a lot like some scientists have proposed could happen in the very distant future through natural processes, observing the universe as it functions now, since God put it into motion, if you will, since he turned on the machine. At some point in the distant future, the universe will collapse in on itself and a new universe will be born from it, explode, if you will, into existence. That kind of scenario does not contradict scripture. It could happen very much like that, but God is the one who will do it when the time comes, he'll choose and he'll, he'll do it when the time comes. But those to whom he gives eternal life, we won't die when that happens. We won't perish. We'll continue to live with him forever, like we are now, but in eternal bodies. So let's move on for a moment to the moon. Can you see this right here? Uh, yes, it's a, fa a very definite face. That's on the moon. And that's actually literally right next to some of the Apollo astronauts. Hmm. In fact, I have photos and, and by the way, that's not edited at all. You see the line in it, but that's not from editing. That's exactly as NASA released it. And I'll explain why the line is there in a moment. That's not edited. It's not adjusted for brightness or contrast. There is zero editing on that for me. The only thing that's occurred is it's been enlarged, nothing more, okay? That's precisely as NASA released it. Does NASA know that that exists on the moon? Nope. If they did, they would have whitewashed it. They'd have edited it out of the photo. They don't know. And in fact, I have photos and video footage. And uh, let me see if I gave a link where this can, well, I, I shared this on Gab and some other media. Let's see if I can and just bring that up by itself. You still see it? Yeah. Okay. That's not adjusted at all. I'll show you what it looks like if we auto adjust it in a moment. The Apollo astronauts walked close to this thing. Never said anything. There are other creatures like it in the same area that they walked the same set of photos, same day. That was one set of Apollo astronauts. I have photos and video footage of almost every Apollo astronaut from the multiple missions that walked the surface of the moon, walking among and even physically examining fossils on the surface of the moon. Not one of them to this day has said anything publicly about it. I have proof and I'm gonna give it to the public, including this photo. So what you're looking at here is a head and a shoulder and a fully exposed part of um, 
the lower portion of a leg and a fully exposed paw. So if you and I, and you probably can't see me right now, but if you were to put your arm up to your side at 90 degrees and take your palm and flip it away from your body, right? So at the top of your hand is facing your head rather than your palm. And put your fingers together and then stick your head and that same shoulder and that arm and that palm out of the ground and just have your arm and that palm and that shoulder lying on the ground as if you were just kind of digging your way out of the dirt and the right side of your head sticking out of the ground. That's exactly what you're seeing here from a creature mm. on its side profile. And you can see right here, and I'll, it'll be more obvious when I auto adjust it. This is not adjusted. Now, with the gray ash even covering it a little bit, here's the mouth, the nose area, and you can see the nostrils actually. There's one, there's another one, a little hard to make out. The chin area, this is the eye area right here, the ear area back here. Here's the shoulder, right? Here's the shoulder, this area. Maybe a little part of the neck or the chest right there where the pointer is. Here's the lower part of the leg. Bent at the elbow here. The elbow is hidden right back here. It's buried under the ground. You can't see the elbow. Okay. So it goes like this. The elbow is still buried right here. And then here is the paw. And notice how many claws there are or, or pads to the paw. One, two, three, four, five. Same as on Earth for most creatures, right? If you were to see like a paw of a lion or a bear or whatever. And notice they get bigger and smaller, just like on Earth. There's the biggest one and they get progressively smaller until you get to the smallest one, just like on Earth. Okay, so let's take this now. I'll copy it and let's put it in Earth on view. Paste it in here. And let's auto adjust it. And again, we could do much better if we were using, you know, professional software and taking our time and not just doing everything automatically. How much more obvious is it all of a sudden? You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. This one image is proof of complex biological life on the moon. The fact that it was photographed among Apollo astronauts by Apollo astronauts is proof of a NASA conspiracy and cover-up. The fact that there are all kinds of others around it, which I'm not showing here, and I haven't shown publicly yet, uh, is proof of a NASA cover-up. The fact that I can show astronauts examining fossils, including large ones. Okay, this is not a big one. This one is probably not bigger than you and me. The fact that there are big ones that they examined as well as ones this size and smaller, including they walked among and crushed with their boots, because I've got photos of that too, or they crushed desiccated ones before and after photos, right? The fact that that stuff exists and I can show it from NASA photos and give people the ability to go independently verify it, proof of a complete cover up in relation to our moon. And, and so, so the, this is, and, and so what you're saying, I mean, just to summarize it for everybody, is that we had a solar system catastrophe where the planet, some people say it's Tiamat, exploded. There was a solar system catastrophe. The planet was pulverized into the asteroid belt. And from there, uh, all of that debris came into Mars came into Earth's moon, came into the Earth, which caused the flood. And we're looking at uh, the fossilized, the fossil of a creature that, what occurred to that creature on the moon during that solar system catastrophe. Yes, and there could be some living life on the moon still. I have proof of that as well in the yeah. upcoming Solar Apocalypse series. So, now, so let me now tell you they, a little oh, bit more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are people, I mean, just, just to state it, there are people that say that the moon 
is an artificial satellite and is one of the control points for mind control on Earth. There's a Saturn moon complex. These are conspiracy theories or theories. I'm just kind of raising them. All right. Well, let me say a few things. One is biblically, it's a natural body. As far as we know, God didn't tell us any differently. Is it possible that it could be something artificial that God put there, like he's going to make the new Jerusalem, right? That's a giant craft, a city built by God himself, according to scripture. A pyramid so large that uh, the moon would just be big enough to compass it, okay? A gigantic, gigantic city that's uh, essentially roughly 1,200 miles in each dimension. One giant pyramid, okay? You can imagine a pyramid 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles, roughly. Don't quote me on that. You can look up the dimensions in the book of Revelation, but very huge. So... If God can build that, you know, and for him it's easy, and bring it to brand new earth that he speaks into existence along with a new solar system just a little over a thousand years from now, could he put an artificial moon around the orbit, around the earth to orbit the planet for whatever purpose? Of course he could. No problem. Easy for him to do. Is it artificial? I don't have a reason to believe that that's the case. I am aware of the claims. So I'll just say that about it. I do have reason to believe, however, that there may be extant life under the surface of the moon. And that comes in multiple forms. But before I go into that, let me just make a couple points about this photo that's displayed. You know, NASA takes photos, and in this case, the Apollo astronauts did, and then they uh, stitch them together, right? To get larger panoramas, okay? In the case of this image, where these lines are, part of that is the stitching that NASA did. And by the way, this image is directly from NASA. This isn't from some third party site. This one is straight from NASA. And this is exactly how NASA released it as part of a larger image, okay? With the Apollo astronauts in it, et cetera. So our moon, I said, had a, a liquid water ocean and an atmosphere. It wasn't gray when it had that any more than the earth is gray from space today, but that's what it had and it was habitable. It might've been light blue, we don't know. We can't go back and see it right now, but whatever it was, it was habitable. It had a liquid water ocean and you know this atmosphere that maybe humans with some help could have breathed, we don't know today, but it was capable of sustaining life. Like other planetary bodies in the solar system were, the life that God made here originally. And this is a theory that I have, Alfred, and I can't go prove it. It certainly would take me a lifetime to do it, and I'm not going to try. But I have the theory that in humanity and in the other creatures God made here on Earth, he put in the genomes the ability to adapt to different atmospheric conditions, to different gravitational conditions, not immediately. So in other words, if you and I were to be dropped off on uh, the pre-flood moon or the pre-flood Mars, as they were without some transition period, genetic, uh, biologically, I should say, some natural adaptation allowed to occur through a gradual transition. If we were to just suddenly be stuck there, yeah, we probably would have died and it probably would have happened pretty quickly. But I have this idea that genetically, we probably have in us from God from the start, the genes necessary so that if those were suddenly expressed, triggered and then expressed by the right conditions, we could have survived on the moon as God made it habitable, could have survived on Mars as God made it habitable, et cetera, before the destruction occurred. We can still survive here on earth. We would still today have the genes in us right now that would allow us to adapt in that way in the future if we had the original Mars and the original moon undamaged, still present in our solar system. So having said that, there's a certain amount of adaptation in these chimeric hybrids that could be possible. They could have been genetically modified to not need to breathe an oxygenated atmosphere. Atmosphere, a lot of different possibilities that way, just using what we humans already know to be biological fact among creatures that God made here on earth. Those things we can scientifically speculate reasonably could be possible genetically. And yet the Nephilim, pardon me, very, very quickly, very early on, 
had the technology necessary to traverse our solar system in craft. This is how they seeded other bodies in our solar system. And they've been doing it ever since in those craft, meaning traversing the earth, our solar system, potentially beyond it with interstellar capability. We have craft like that now in secret space programs locked up in black projects. Presumably Russia does, China might, possibly some other nations. But that being said, what could they have done genetically early on the Nephilim if they already had the knowledge necessary to produce any gravitic craft? I'm going to suggest an awful lot. And we're already today humans reaching the point where we could produce chimeric hybrids. We're very close to being able to violate those genetic barriers that God put in place to prevent creatures from naturally mixing with creatures of different types that he made. He put genetic barriers in place, for example, to prevent you know, a dog crossing with a cat or a human crossing with a sheep or any number of things you could think of, right? But when those barriers are broken down, it becomes possible to produce unnatural things. And the Nephilim managed to do that. And they seeded this all over. As far as the moon goes, it was habitable, habitable, whether it had plant life on it, I don't know. I don't have evidence of that. It did have uh, algae, almost certainly lichen. I have evidence of algae. A lot of the life on Earth, Alfred, is bioluminescent. This is something that people have only more recently become aware of. The majority, the vast majority of life on Earth, including in our oceans, bioluminescence. Most humans don't realize that. Most people don't know that. A lot of biologists know that now. If life is bioluminescing, in most cases, it means the life is still alive. There are a few cases where something that has died will continue to bioluminesce. In most cases, the bioluminescence ceases upon death. So there are two things that I can document and demonstrate with relation to the moon. One is there are tracks dug in craters with dead creatures at the end of them, fossils. Pairs of tracks going in multiple directions from some craters. You can see from that that boulders unnaturally rolled up and out of the craters and down their sides or unnaturally rolled up the sides of the craters and into them in pairs or that somehow creatures exited the craters, made their tracks and quickly died, going in multiple directions. There's evidence for that on the moon. Does that mean there's something surviving subsurface in the moon? I'll come back to that. The second thing is there are craters, multiple craters on the moon, particularly the deeper ones, where there are glowing white objects next to dark objects, which without looking at them too closely, have the outlines of creatures. When you do look at them closely, and we do have that ability with a, a lot of the photos NASA has taken from orbit, the full resolution photos, you can see that what you appear to be looking at is bioluminescing reptiles, whether they're alive or dead, I don't know, partially or further exposed on the surface of the moon. And in some cases, there's enough light to where they are illuminating darker ones next to them that don't bioluminesce. In some cases, it appears that there are creatures eating creatures, creatures, pardon me. In others, there's reasons to believe that there might be lichen growing or algae, either one. So having said that, we know that creatures on earth eat each other, certain creatures do. A lot of creatures use algae and lichen as primary food sources. And oddly enough, that includes reptiles. A lot of people don't know that. Both reptiles and insects and even some birds will use lichen and algae as primary food sources. So if there's algae all over Mars today, and there is, you know, not just lichen, if there's algae on the moon and there's a good chance that there is, and algae can grow in conditions that don't require an oxygenated, oxygenated atmosphere, and can grow in extreme cold as well. You know, in certain circumstances when warmed up enough, you know, even in freezing and warming, freezing and thawing circumstances, tardigrades can survive in space and be thawed out and live subsequently. 
they don't die when they're completely frozen solved. They can be thawed later and, and can live. And they're complex biology, even though they're tiny. They're little animals, tardigrades. They're also known as water bears. So any number of things could have been done by the Nephilim, but here's what's true. There are tracks exiting multiple craters. There are creatures like this thing on the Mars that have died as they've exposed themselves on the surface of, excuse me, on the moon, that has died as they've exposed themselves on the surface. There are complex biological fossils all over the surface of the moon, just like on Mars. Our astronauts encountered them and examined them, walked around them and photographed them. Our orbital platforms have photographed many. I haven't gotten into Titan-sized things yet, but they exist on the moon as well, including Titan-sized heads exposed in the centers of craters, reptiles. I have evidence of that, including evidence that NASA tried to cover some of those up before and after, before and after photos, in other words. There are photos that suggest technology structures, in other words, on the moon in certain places. Um, I'll say two things about those. One is I've got extreme proof of highly angular fossils on Mars that you wouldn't expect unless you could see the eyes and the noses, the mouths, the teeth, certain other portions of those heads in certain fossils. They're highly angular and they can be proven to be heads. Without that knowledge, they would look like artificial structures that are highly geometric to most people. There are highly angular structures in some places exposed on the surface of the moon which could be artificial structures. I wouldn't argue against that as a likely explanation. Another possibility, however, is that they are these angular creatures like what's on Mars. And I think I've seen enough to suggest that those are on the moon also, um, so at least to a certain extent. So that being said, if the moon is really only thousands of years old, Alfred, rather than tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions. And in fact, you could say it's true even if it's only hundreds of thousands of years old. And I'm gonna say it's much, much younger than that based on the biblical account. But if our moon were hundreds of thousands of years old, and at one point, any point in that period of time, it had a liquid water ocean and an atmosphere, there would to this day be enough heat retained on the interior of the moon for there to be liquid water at some depth, probably a depth that could be reached through volcanic lava tubes with some digging, possibly. Possibly a depth that could be reached with very advanced boring technology. If we were to put it there in the future, we could possibly run into liquid water under the surface of the moon today with the technology we have. The reason that would be possible, the reason there could even be active volcanism still on the moon and there is evidence to suggest even now that there might be possibly in recent history, uh, what even macroevolutionists would call recent history, some active volcanism on the moon, including lava tubes and so forth. If there's any activity like that, and there could be, or any liquid water under the surface of the moon, and there could be, then that would be argumentation enough to suggest that there might be some surviving life, dangerous life even, under the surface of the moon that had been seeded there. So how was the moon destroyed? We, I've mentioned it was bombarded, right? Unlike Mars and unlike the Earth, the moon suffered complete catastrophe to its atmosphere. It was totally ripped away rapidly. Almost the whole surface of the moon was engulfed in flames with some of those impacts. So that what was there was burned most of it, and ash formed across the whole surface of the moon and didn't just stay on the surface. You know, it was up in, in what had been the atmosphere, just above the surface and, and lower in, you know, low down in space. Would have rained down over the surface of the moon for a significant period of time, but eventually landed. And what you would see is exactly the moon we have today, covered in this gray stuff that, by the way, isn't dirt. That regolith isn't just dirt. It is ash. That is what it is. It is fine ash. It is volcanic type ash in many cases, but it's fine ash. And that's the reason it looks gray by and large. So the whole surface, the moon, not all of it, but much of it, you can see is that gray ash today. And when they put those pods, you know, those dish-like pods 
on the bottom bottom of the Apollo landers, right? Before landing on the surface of the moon. The reason they did that, Alfred, is because they were afraid that without those, there'd be so much dust accumulated on the surface of the moon that the landers themselves, touching down even lightly, would suddenly be buried completely in dust, suddenly engulfed and, and completely buried in dust, loosely accumulated on the surface of the moon over in their mind, you know, millions or billions of years, right? And they, you know, had estimated that based on what they thought to be the amount of dust from space reaching Earth's atmosphere on an annual basis, on a regular basis. They had estimated that. And on that basis said, well, okay, if, if about the same amount is reaching the surface of the moon, then over this period of time, there's gonna be this massive amount of dust accumulated on the surface of the moon. And there's no water, right? There's no anything to blow it away, you know, to prevent it from accumulating just forever, basically. And so they put these pods in the landers, right? What did they find when they got to the moon? A tiny amount of dust covering the surface. A tiny amount to inches. Pretty much that's it everywhere. Enough to accumulate over a period of thousands of years, maybe 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years. They've estimated it, but you know, over a period of thousands of years in general. Perfectly fits with the scriptural account. Does not fit with the idea of an old moon or with their estimates at least for the accumulation of dust coming from space to the earth, you know, which they use to estimate what might be on the moon. At any rate, so the moon's covered in ash. We know that there are organic chemicals all over the surface of the moon, just like comets and asteroids, just like Mars. They know that about Mars too now. They admit that publicly. We know there are tracks going in multiple directions out of multiple craters. NASA doesn't talk about that. They don't admit the obvious. NASA has covered up both fossils and heads that they know about on the surface of the moon. I have evidence that they've covered it up in before and after photos. This is one they missed. And so I won't say where it is till the books are released, but I have a lot of things like this. This is my favorite because of that paw, right? But I actually have better heads than this one, but they don't have the paw like this one. I love this one because of that. It's so obvious. And um, so that's what I'll say about it. The real history of our solar system, Alfred, fits in with scripture. It fits in with young earth creationism. It fits in with a biblical account. Biblical account. To date, there is no explanation from non-Christians, and they don't know this yet, but after today, they will. Those who are paying attention to all of the stuff I've shared here so far, after today, they should. I am the first human being on earth, uh, first human being in history, that's what I'm trying to say, to share this stuff publicly. Some of these things, I did talk about some of these things. I did not show a photo like this back in 2016. I did not show this in 2018. I didn't give any evidence for what's on the moon, though I did talk about it back then. I've begun to share it now because I'm close. So with this, it overturns the idea of an old solar system minimally, if not an old universe, certainly an old solar system. It overturns all the models that today's astrophysicists have proposed for how our solar system or any planetary body, including the sun, formed in it. It destroys all their models in one fell swoop immediately, instantaneously. It wipes out all those PhDs shows they never knew what they were talking about in the first place. That being said, it does fit the biblical account. And we would call this uh, not cosmology per se, that would be an astrophysical term, cosmogony, which has to do with the origin of things. This overturns astrophysics in terms of how the universe, particularly the solar system formed. Uh, and will force people to re-examine evolution from a completely different perspective because it all starts with evolutionary astrophysics, right? For example, if the earth is young, the solar system is young, even if they want to try to come up with some other explanation, they don't have enough time in that circumstance to explain evolution of any form on earth. There are other reasons macroevolution is not possible scientifically, including the second law of thermodynamics. 
you know, thermodynamics, there, there are, uh, including information theory, including a dozen other things I could mention scientifically that disprove even the possibility of biological evolution, okay? Without any of that, this one photo, and, and particularly the stuff I showed in comments and asteroids, especially that, overturns the idea of an old age solar system, destroys any possibility of evolution on Earth due to time frames, any possibility of our solar system forming over billions of years, because now there aren't any building blocks left to point to. They had been pointing to comets and asteroids, right? As the building blocks are planetary bodies. Suddenly those can't be building blocks anymore because they're filled with complex biological fossils. Provably so, demonstrably so, already photographed by more than one space agency. The photos are already public. People just have to go look and find the stuff I'm talking about. I already have, I'm gonna serve it up on a silver platter. So here we are, close to the Lord's return. I gave you a hard evidence in our last interview. People who are seeing this one can ask you for the link to that to go see it. I have it on my YouTube channel and other places on the internet where I've shared stuff, but I provided to you hard evidence of the actual identity of the foretold antichrist and biblical prophecy who's alive now. And the fact that we are now nearing provably the time of Jesus's or Yeshua's, his Hebrew name, return to judge and save mankind, meaning Armageddon is not far away. I will say this, you know, in, in closing, before I answer any questions you have, uh, people, particularly Christians, but also others, really want to understand the purpose of the UFO phenomena, why these humanoids are, are you know, seeming to visit Earth, why they're abducting and impregnating human women and taking the, the unborn humanoid children, what their real agenda is, why they seem to be colluding with governments, those who are really looking into this and becoming aware of this, why they seem to be colluding with governments, what's the purpose of that behind the scenes? Why are governments willingly, you know, uh, do they have a choice, but why do they seem to be willingly let, letting these creatures abduct or take human men and women to acquire reproductive materials, egg, sperm, uh, gosh, uh, different kinds of stem cells from behind eyeballs. I mean, I could go on and on with different weird things that they're taking, different sorts of um, chemicals from the bodies. Why are they taking human beings to take those things and then returning those human beings, leaving them to think that nothing happened other than some mark or puncture on another body that seemed mostly healed or some memory they might have later under hypnosis or might happen later where they think they had some strange or disturbing experience. Why is that being done and why is it being seemingly allowed by governments? There are a whole host of questions beyond even those to ask and answer. All the questions are asked, they're all actually answered in my solar apocalypse series, in many cases with hard evidence, like what I'm showing here. That being said, there is a purpose to this and it is, there are multiple purposes. The first one is to engage mankind directly in the war against God and against Christ at his return to make humanity think that when Jesus, Yeshua returns with his angels from heaven, two thirds of them never sinned. They didn't transgress, they didn't fall with Satan and the other angels. They didn't follow Lucifer and his rebellion against God. Two thirds of the angels remained on God's side, their creator's side. When Yeshua, who is the creator incarnate in a human body returns with his angels, following behind him, looking like bright burning stars toward the earth, and that's exactly how they'll look because the sun will be obscured. The moon won't be shining any light. The sun will be turned off like a light bulb seemingly. So that the only light that's seen on earth is the Lord himself looking like a bright burning star coming from heaven toward the earth with angels looking like bright burning stars behind him coming from the heavens toward the earth. When that happens, then Satan and the other fallen angels in humanity, meaning these secret space programs working with them behind the scenes, you know, having shared the anti-gravitic technology and other things, will finally be forced to come out in the open if they don't do so prior to that. And I'm gonna talk about the prior to that part in a moment. They'll be forced to come out in the open and say to mankind, you know what? Uh, and this is me speculating, but it's educated speculation, okay? They'll come out and say something along the lines of, you know what? We've heard 
something like this might happen. We've read about it in scripture, but you know, Satan is not the bad guy. Lucifer is not the bad guy. Jesus is the bad guy. He's coming to do something that takes away our freedom or whatever explanation they offer, right? This yin yang, this duality, dualism, whatever explanation they try to offer. And then they'll say, we've known some explanation like this is covering. We know coming. We know that uh, he's coming to harm us, to kill a lot of us on earth, to ostensibly judge the earth. We don't want that. We're joining with these aliens who've come to help us, who, by the way, had a hand in creating us. That's why they're genetically related to us. They created us, not God. He didn't create us. They created us. We're related to them. They made us, not the other way around. They didn't come from us. We came from them. And they've been working with us to ensure our preservation, our survival, to help us environmentally, you know, to work out, you know, watch out for us, environment, et cetera. But also in case this day came, to be prepared militarily to make war with them using their technology and ours combined to make war with them against Christ, against Jesus and his angels to stop them from what they're intended to do on the earth. In other words, to make God and his angels the bad guys instead of the good guys, to turn the truth on its head, to make mankind think that we came from the aliens instead of them coming from us, the fake aliens, they're fakes. That's the satanic deception, that's part of it, but that's where it begins. The devil and his fallen angels are deceived enough to think they can get away with this, that maybe they have a snowball's chance in hell to actually prevail. They don't, but they're insane. They're going to try it. And they're so prepared for it, Alfred, that they think, should they succeed? They're already, for the, ready, they're already prepared for the next step. The next step beyond enslaving humanity under the Antichrist initially is to reach the point where these humanoids, these chimeric hybrids produced from life that God made here on earth through abductions, through other things in their version of laboratories, humanoid laboratories, aboard their craft and elsewhere. The next step is to reach the point where some or all of these humanoids can reproduce by themselves without, with no need anymore for biological material from human women, human men, other creatures God made here on earth. When they cross that line, if and when they succeed, they're working toward it. They won't need humanity anymore. And should they succeed in their war against God, they'll annihilate all mankind everywhere and replace us with their humanoid abominations. And I'll call them abominations. They're fake aliens. And those fake aliens will worship the devil and his angels as their gods, as their makers. And so finally, the devil and the fallen angels and some of the demons will be enthroned, if you will, as quote unquote gods over their own creatures, you know, even though they started with what God made, you know, and God will be overthrown as far as they're concerned in creation. They're working towards something like that, maybe not exactly like that, but comparable to that. That's where they're going. And they want to take mankind with them to the point where they've defeated Christ at Armageddon and his angels at Armageddon. And then they want to annihilate us. They, they want mankind to think that they're the good guys in the meantime, that they're here to help us. That was never their plan. They were here to, uh, to use, abuse, and then annihilate mankind and take as many humans to hell as they could by preventing mankind from believing in the real God and receiving actual salvation, actual eternal life, actual eternal bodies, actual freedom from sin, etc. And in the final state, when the Lord makes the new heavens and the new earth a little more than a thousand years from now, there won't be any sin. There won't be any fallen angels remaining in it. They'll all be consigned to a version of hell for eternity to never, ever be heard from again by any creature outside that place in creation. No human will ever encounter them again. There won't be a duality. There won't be a yin and a yang. Uh, a darkness and a light like you see in Star Wars, perpetually warring against one another, vying for who's going to be top dog for a while. You know, is it going to be the darkness or the light, the Zoroastrian model? All that is a satanic deception. None of that will continue past that thousand years when the Lord makes the new heavens and the new earth. There'll be a permanent end to all of it. And only good will remain in the universe so far as any of God's creatures will ever see or know again except the ones that are consigned to hell and we'll never hear from or see them again or encounter them again. 
So that's what's coming. We're all faced with a massive deception. And what God has me doing, the reason I think he has me doing this in addition to identifying and exposing the Antichrist to the church and then the world, is to give all those people in this movement, the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions around the world, maybe tens or hundreds of millions. And I would estimate it probably at that latter figure, Alfred, tens to hundreds of millions of people today throughout the world who think, you know what? We probably did evolve. God probably didn't make us, as the scripture says. We probably are related to quote unquote aliens. Aliens probably exist. They probably did come here to earth and tamper with life on earth. They probably are looking out for us to preserve us, not so they can continue to exist, but so that we can. They probably are the good guys and probably will help us to keep going, you know, in the future. At least we hope that's the case. We don't know what UFOs but they are, but they probably are alien. Maybe they are working with our governments. You know, people around the world, and I would say tens to hundreds of billions of them are thinking along those lines already today. And certainly most of your audience has been thinking along those lines for much of their lives. I'm here to say it's a massive set of deceptions. It's an integrated set of deceptions. God has sent me to give you and all of them and a lot of the rest of the world, the real evidence with the real explanations. I'm involved in this because God wouldn't allow a non-Christian to come along and provide this level of evidence that's verifiable with false explanations. In other words, he sent me because I can provide the real explanations with the real evidence everybody has been seeking. And I'm going to hand that evidence to the world on a silver platter. So that's what I really want your audience to lay hold of, Alfred. Eventually, I hope to make this stuff free. It's not going to be for a while, just because of publication costs. If there's anybody listening who wants all this stuff to be free, who will fund the cost of publishing and distribution, because I want there to be physical printed books, not just electronic ones out there. If there's somebody who will fund that, come along, do that. I'll give it all away for free. I won't make a penny on any of it. So I just want to say that. You know, this is not me out to make a buck. This is me out to see souls saved and to give everyone the truth. I wanted this before I was a believer. I didn't have it. I have it now. God's given it to me to give to everybody else. That's the whole point. It's not to make money. So if anybody is listening, you, if you know anybody with whom you can share this, for example, like an Elon Musk, like a Jeff Bezos, you know, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. He wants to be one of the first humans there. He might be one of the first meals for a dinosaur surviving on Mars if he does that, not having heard any of this. That's a real possibility. It's not a joke. Sounds funny. You know, Elon Musk needs to hear this. He alone could fund getting this into the hands of everybody and giving everyone the truth. There are people who could do this. So I'm offering it. I'll give it all away if there's somebody who will just fund the effort. So I'll just leave it at that. Otherwise, it won't be free. Prophecy asks the publisher will have to charge for it in order to fund the effort to get this stuff out, to provide printed books, to make it available to everybody, both in print and electronically. Yeah, so you're, you're, uh, <clears throat> you're at prophecyhouse.com. Well, there, there's so many levels to what you brought and, and uh, you're appearing here under the aegis of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which uh, is freedom of expression, religious freedom, uh, and the Charter of uh, uh, Rights and Liberties. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in Canada, the U.N. Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so there are many, many layers to, to what you uh, have brought here. Uh, what we advertised this as was life on Mars and celestial bodies. And so part of it has, uh, is, is seeing this, this extraordinary uh, uh, research that you have now bringing forward of, of the evidence of uh, uh, fossilized life uh on mars and on the moon that is consistent with uh a, a solar system catastrophe 
that is consistent with, uh, on the one hand, the the biblical version that you uh, posit, and I also stated that the law of one. Uh, we we had the person who did the transcriptions of the law of one as a guest here, and and uh, the law of one gives us slightly di different version of how the Tiamat, Mars, Earth, uh, Venus, Moon, solar system catastrophe occurred. But I I'm just saying that that we're respecting the first amendment here and let me let me just interject for a moment alfred quickly yeah. all the stuff i've shown is in the public domain oh yeah sure not not any of these not one of these photos not anything in them is stolen or um hacked or anything else nasa just doesn't know what it's released or where but it's all in right. the public domain right. it's all direct it, it, it's, it's all, not just nasa it, it's all public so people ha just haven't found it. God has led me to it. So people right. will be able to go and publicly download this stuff freely when the time comes. Yeah, yeah. But and point out where to look. And there are many different models out there of what uh, of of reality of the creator behind the reality. There there are many different models of Christianity there. You know. And so I just wanted to to uh, uh, state no, that brother. yeah no no it, it's fine yeah. that that uh, 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 we have fulfilled a uh, uh, sharing uh, a a science based uh, show on life on Mars. And the moon, and along with that, we've had a discussion of cosmogenies. I just want to make those distinctions and, and because, comets and asteroids. Comets yeah, and and, asteroids yeah, and, and and yeah, yeah. comets and, and, and asteroids, because of the First Amendment and the history of the U.S. and you know the planet, people are very touchy about their religion and their beliefs uh and so we we have to respect people's boundaries here and let me let me say alfred i started out as um an agnostic agnostic who said he was an atheist and didn't mm -hmm. know the difference in the terms when i was in college that's where i started i was raised a secular jew uh, I started out as the furthest thing in a lot of ways from being a Christian. You know, so I'm not here to offend anybody. I'm here to give everybody evidence to consider that they haven't heard. Right. Right. And I just want to separate that people can, there, there are different levels that you've come with evidence about. One level is has to do with the fossils, and that's extremely interesting. The other level is of the solar system catastrophe, and that is extremely interesting. The other level is a cosmogony to express ex explain the solar system uh, catastrophe in terms of creationism, which is a huge step for many people and and uh uh so i just want to respect your space and i want to respect the space of everyone here i want to keep the comments on youtube to a dull roar <laughs> <laughs> and uh it makes my job easier and and uh uh to to to, to say that that uh you know this is this is such a thought provoking um uh, uh uh conversation and encounter that you brought here what i was going to suggest almost before you you began 
sort of the Revelation chapter 13 closing. I, oh. I, I, I didn't expect the Revelation chapter 13 closing. What I was going to su suggest before you went there, I was going to say, oh, Timothy, you know, it's time for you to get your slideshow with your, with the life on Mars, the fossils and et cetera, and to start going to all conferences and, you know, really change because you, you were saying this, this overturns the existing scientific paradigm. And I was about to say, well, you know, start getting, polishing away your show and start going to all the conferences and, you know, upsetting well, me, those paradigms. Let me say this. If there, I have attempted unsuccessfully, but I've attempted to reach out some, to some of the ancient aliens folks. Uh, you know, uh, to, to some of the ancient what? aliens, ancient aliens folks. Oh, okay. You know, the History Channel. Uh, only one of them I spoke with at a conference. Uh, Mike Berry. He's been very polite, and I've I've enjoyed his company. I haven't spent much time with him, but some. But he hasn't either tried or succeeded. I don't know which to breach that wall with the ancient aliens folks. Another one, Nick Pope. Incredibly polite, really friendly guy. Yeah, uh, really, really like him. Nice guy. I've interacted with him a bit, you know, just by messaging, but not much. I don't think he shared any of this stuff, to my knowledge, with any of these other folks. All the rest of them completely ignored me. Um, I have attempted, not for years, by the way, but I did attempt in the past, back around the 2016 timeframe, to reach out to some of these groups to suggest, maybe you might want to think about having me as a speaker because I can show some new things to you. And uh, and do exactly what you're talking about. Never had any response. I attempted to share with one other person who just um, couldn't get it, couldn't see it, and that was a waste of time. But the bottom line, and I reached out to Michael Sala too. I did show him a few, show him privately a yeah. few of the photos I shared today with you and some others. Uh, I hope to speak with him again further. But mostly, it's been walls. And I think, honestly, if well, people can see what I shared today, yeah. hopefully some of those walls will come down and yeah. there'll be an opportunity to, to go well, further. Well, could I ask you, do you, do you share the, the Mars and Moon uh, fossil information by itself, or do you always share the Christian belief information with it? I do put it in the context, if I'm speaking, of the time frame of before Noah's flood and after the creation of Adam and Eve. So I do talk okay. about the catastrophe in the solar system being in that time frame. Uh, and that the Nephilim seeded these things to other bodies in our solar system. Beyond that, I don't actually know. I just stick with yeah. this yeah. non-terrestrial yeah. life stuff well, and what's on the moon. Yeah. And Mars yeah. And well, you see, you're you are uh those are two, uh, the amount of paradigm shifting that there's a certain amount of paradigm shifting that individuals have to go through just to begin to look at the, at the fossils and, and to get beyond pareidolia, to get beyond brain patterns. Now, boom, so it's there now. If you're going to add on to it a Christian creationist uh, second condition or requirement or add-on, no, there's there's no there's no requirement. I'll literally speak to any audience. No, 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 no right, right. But I, I'm saying that I'm just saying that yeah. my guess is that you may have not. This is the the fossil part is so compelling, and the creationist is so strange to an evolutionary audience, which is what the society is. The society is evolutionary, and you're coming with a creationist, an insistent creationist message that by mixing the two, you may be giving mixed messages that, oh, you 
in order to accept uh, these, the message of the fossils or the veracity of the fossils, you have to shift to a creationist paradigm. And so you may be making things more difficult for yourself. Okay, I'm well, let me saying, address that. I, I don't think that, uh, you know, there are fossils on Mars. There are fossils on the moon. There are fossils on comets and asteroids. To see those things and accept them, yeah, you don't have to accept anything else. You can just exactly. say, okay, they're there. I can accept that. Exactly. That really isn't the point. The point is I feel it's my duty, uh, at least I a see. little bit, to yeah. put it in the context of scripture. Context. And to be honest with you, that isn't one part of it is for the for the audience, such as yours, right? Yeah. That hasn't heard these things from a creationist yeah. perspective and yeah. thinks the aliens did it. Yeah. So this is a new and novel way for them to think about it from a person who's giving them evidence nobody else could ever present to them before. So they ought to take it seriously for that reason alone. Right. For the Christian side, if all I did was present what's on Mars or the moon and didn't bother to try to put it into a biblical context of timeline and when and how and the rest, boy, that would cause a lot of Christians probably, you know, when I say Christians, I'm talking nominal ones to just walk away from the faith. Oh, they would think I no. haven't been told the truth. They would, oh. they would just look at that without the proper explanation for the creationist context and oh, think, wow, maybe life did evolve on Mars, you know, and come to earth oh. or something like that. You know, maybe the Bible's I account see. isn't true. So it's I really see. important as a Christian that I include that other part, especially to that audience. To the other audience that they don't want to hear any of that, and I just give them the evidence, and they get my books yeah. and they see the evidence. They have the ability in those books to look at the rest of what I believe, yeah. To look at the context of why I believe it, and to investigate that if they wish. Yeah. Okay. Well, more to know. I really appreciate and and I'm very appreciative of your openness to dialogue and to uh, uh to bring your of of your bringing your truth and your perspective which i understand and and which is ed educational and and you know op opens all of us to new perspectives and yet at the same time to understand that there are other perspectives which are adjusting to your information and trying to see well mm -hmm. Let's let me uh, let me Alfred say a small number of things that are going to happen in the world in the near future. Okay. The reason I'll share these is because number one, no non-Christian on the planet could share this information. They don't know it, or they don't believe it. Their brains can't process it. They can they can hear it and remember it and believe it when they see it. Number two. Uh, this is related to Bible prophecy, and I'm going to talk about the next few years, some specific, very objective, very obvious things that are going to happen. So there's no non-Christian, including anyone in your audience who's not a Christian, who could know these things in advance or say they're going to happen. And, who, and so thus, your audience, when they see these things happen, and you'll have it recorded in advance from me, when they see them happen, they'll know for that reason that, gee, maybe there is something to this Christianity beyond what I've thought versus these other views, because none of these other views, including Urantia, for example, know about or could relate or could speak in advance before they happen about the things that I'm going to tell you now and your audience are near and about to happen in the world, okay? So one of those things is and this is pretty close to the exact sequence. One of those things is we're going to see World War III actually break out and North Korea and Iran will be involved. When the wars include North Korea and Iran, World War III has started and we're already in the final seven years leading to Armageddon at that point in Christ's return. We're, we're less than six years away from Armageddon at that point. I don't know if that'll be this year or years from now. Don't know that yet. Could be this year. We'll see. After that, uh, on the heels of World War III, there will be global mass starvation and famine, unlike what the world has ever before seen. 
comparable maybe to what ancient Egypt experienced under Joseph when there was famine in the land for seven years. Only worse because this will be the whole world that gets involved in it. And the world will be talking about global famine, just like so many people are worrying about global famine next year, right now in the news all over the world. Will that be the famine? I don't know that yet, and I'm not saying that we'll see. So there will be World War III leading global famine. Right after that, and continuing from that, Israel will be successfully attacked by her surrounding adversaries. The entire city of Jerusalem will be encircled, encircled by the militaries of Israel's adversaries. The United States will be part of that when the time comes. Most, well, really all the nations of the world will be part of that because it'll be under a UN banner or something similar under the Antichrist, who I've already said who that is in a prior interview with you. Half of Jerusalem, not the whole city, only half, will be taken captive by force in war. Even though the entire city has been encircled, even though the entire city could be taken, only half will be taken. And that half will include the Temple Mount area where the old city is, the original city of David, where by that time, Israel will have already constructed a new holy place and will have already begun sacrifice and offering to God again, which he will reject, but they will have already started it by that point in time. On the heels of those things, the foretold Antichrist, whom I have already said to you is Charles, King Charles III, in our prior interview, and there's evidence in that, folks, so go see that, as well as my other interviews on that topic. The foretold Antichrist will receive a mortal wound in a way that he should die. Maybe he will die or seem to have died. We don't know. We'll see when the time comes. But the expectation will be so great that he's a dead man or an actual dead man when the time comes, that he'll recover from that in a way that seems so bizarre to the whole world that the world will begin to follow after him and literally worship him and the devil. Literally. He will be possessed by Satan in connection with that recovery and remain possessed for the next three and a half years, roughly, the whole period in which he will then be over a global government. The government doesn't exist yet. It will be constituted at that same time. How that gets constituted, that's in my book, The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. They're already talking about doing it right now, and they have been for years. So those are a few things. World War III, global famine and mass starvation. Israel successfully attacked, half of Jerusalem taken captive by war, uh, by force in war. That half includes the old city where there will already be a newly constructed holy place and new sacrifice on the Temple Mount by Israel at that time. The Antichrist receiving a mortal wound and recovering from it in, the, in a way that the world begins to follow after him and worship him. Additionally, an idol will be erected to him on the Temple Mount. That idol already exists. People can see that in my presentations. And two witnesses, two prophets of God, one of whom will be the actual Elijah of the Old Testament. The other might be Enoch of the Old Testament. We don't know who the other one is yet. Could be Enoch, could be Moses, could be someone else. God will reveal who that person is when these two witnesses start their testimony. They will prophesy to the nations of the world that are trampling Eastern Jerusalem and the Temple Mount underfoot at that time and begin to torment the nations of the world as a precursor to Armageddon, which comes three and a half years later, with Christ's return with his angels from heaven. So there are half a dozen things, roughly, and I'm not counting them, that I've specified that are going to occur in the next few years in the order I have stated. There's no one in your answer, no Muslim, no Buddhist, no Hindu, no non-believing Jew, Israelite, no pagan on the planet, no Satanist, no witch, who could tell you all of the things that I have just said or relate that precise sequence or say when they're going to happen even. I've said they're going to happen in the next few years. Other things will occur that are delineated also in my books, many other things, but those things can't be missed by anyone, especially once half of Jerusalem is taken captive in war. And the final point I'll make on that is that Israel has been attacked multiple times in history. Jerusalem has been completely encircled and, in sack and sacked in its entirety, multiple times in history, there was never a time once in all history where only half the city was taken captive in war. And that is what will happen in a few years, uh, in the near future, maybe a 
year and a half from now, maybe years from now. I'm not sure exactly how long we have, whether in the tribulation, whether we're already in the last seven years or not. Yeah. I don't know that yet. Right. But these are happening soon, and this is the sequence in which they'll happen. And and uh, Timothy's books are at prophecyhouse.com. Now, in the interest of fair and equal balance, yes, I just have to say, and this is synchronicity or coincidence, that if you go to my book, which you can find by just going to Amazon and entering my name uh, and go to my book, Tracking the Antichrist, I have an alternative scenario there because I believe that we're on multiple timelines and that, um, uh, uh, so I'm just saying, I, I won't get into the details, but I'm just saying that there are multiple timelines. And so for, alternative scenarios taking to, into account the uh, hermeneutics uh, uh, that uh, Timothy just states. Uh, I just published a book called Tracking the Antichrist that presents alternative scenarios. And that's just in the interests of fair and balanced uh, information. We're always very grateful that you do come on to our programs um, is there anything you, that, that, that you haven't said, uh, uh, yes. that you had wanted to bring to the, to the program? Well, I, I've shared a lot with your audience. I hope you're able to put it all out for them. Oh, that yeah. being said, that being said, um, I said earlier in the interview, I'm an odd bird. There's an awful lot of stuff God has me doing that most people would look at and say, no one person could do all that probably. But I am. And so people can go to my site, prophecyhouse.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y-H-O-U-S-E.com. You'll find my book on the Antichrist. You'll find the Solar Apocalypse series. It's not out yet, not available to get yet, but it will be. Uh, multiple other multi-volume multi series in which I'm working. The second edition of the Antichrist to Kepti will be out this year. It'll go to press this year, ship early next year or in the first half of 2023 people can get that now i have other books and materials that are out and are available now only about two-thirds roughly of what i have coming is mentioned on prophecy house the site so there's even more than what the site mentions that's coming and i'll just leave you folks with that please check out the antichrist the cup of tea look at my other interviews and materials um, check out my book north korea ran and the coming world war behold a red horse that's about to be fulfilled by the way yeah, it's coming really fast. That was published in 2018. Well, so. well, we'd like to um, a couple of things. One is that uh, we'd like to certainly invite you back for a an author's interview when the second edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea is is uh, published. So keep us posted, and and if and when you Thank wish, you. you're you have an open invitation here. The second, the, 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 the second thing is this. You may or may not know, but uh, a number of years back, I was a foreign correspondent for Press TV, which is the, the, uh, the uh, 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 news agency of Iran. And they used to interview me and, uh, and I would give my interpretation. I was not censored, but I could say things there that I was being censored on Western media, for example, talking about 9-11, talking about many different things. Hmm. I was censored on mainstream TV, for example, CNN, I was, uh, 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 criticized on CNN and my positions were, were uh, unjustly criticized and they would not give me equal time. And I could go on Press TV and I could present these things. Well, Press TV called me up about two weeks ago and they interviewed me. Uh, but right in the middle of the interview, I must have blown them away because I began giving them, you know, uh, multi-dimensional answers. So I don't know, whatever. 
So if at any point you want to come back uh, for an interview on your other book, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to take a look at your site here, but it's called North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War. Um, I spent yeah. a lot of time last year. Uh, uh, there was a Brazilian author called Chico Javier. He sold 40 million copies of his books. And he made wow. a prophecy. He made a prophecy in 1969. Uh, he said that if World War III didn't happen over the next 50 years, Mm -hmm. from 19, from July 1st, 1969, it wouldn't happen at all. And that, that, uh, that was accomplished in July of, of uh, 2019. And it was the July date of the US landing on the moon. And he said that he was told this by, uh, you know, he's a very religious person. And so uh, I, I, I widely publicized the Chico Javier prophecies, which are widely known in the third world. So uh, from the Chico Javier point of view, which is a prophecy because it was, it was given in 1969 and the 50 years were up in July, 2019, and there's been no World War III, so it's not going to happen. So once again, I'm coming from that point of view. I know that Revelation 13 says one thing, or one interpretation does, but I'm from the side that there's going to be no World War III. But you're welcome to come, and, and, and I believe that these dialogues serve a public purpose. And so you're welcome. Uh, I'd like to extend the invitation now to come and have that that uh, that particular. Uh, would you like to come and have have a discussion? Yeah. Yep. So I, I so let's uh, okay. let's have a correspondence about when that should happen. Okay. Yeah. On yeah. World War Three, you know, I, I don't. I personally hope we're not in World War Three yet. I'm sure you've noticed that a lot of people particularly since Russia invaded Ukraine, have been saying we're in World War III already. I don't yeah. subscribe to that view. I, I yeah. don't think we are, but I am very concerned. I just got to be honest that it well, could happen. Well, oh, 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 yeah. I would love to have that, to have that, that interview take place within a her hermeneutic context. Mm -hmm. I had before Peter Kling, I, I don't know if you have heard of Peter Kling, but he 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 wrote a book called Letters to Earth, which was a hermeneutics book, and I interviewed him very very frequently. We have uh, we have inter we had interviews on was was uh, then he was a prince was Prince Charles the Antichrist. He even did an interview, was Prince William the Antichrist, you know, blah, 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 because of that picture with the lamb where he held up the uh, the leg of the lamb, remember? The Interesting. cloven hoof of the lamb. That's where it's often thought that Prince William could be an Antichrist. Uh, so uh, I would like very much to have that interview uh, on, on your book, um, uh, the uh, North Korea, Iran, and the coming world war. Let me see to if have I can that, that. To, to, to have that in a hermeneutics context so that we can talk about uh, through the lens of hermeneutics. Uh, yeah, I, I would like that very much because I've, I've also introduced some concepts in my new books, Tracking the Antichrist, that have to do uh, uh, with cosmogony that I'd like to try out on you. So sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll we'll be in touch about scheduling that particular interview. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred. Really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. if you would please share this interview with me afterwards so I can post it separately at some point. Oh yes, yes. I will 
Yeah, I and will I'll, send I'll you link that. to it on my YouTube channel too. I'll I'll link to it on my YouTube channel when you should put it on yours. Oh, great. So, yeah. Well, no, you yeah. know that we have we're streaming live on my inner uh, on my YouTube channel right now. See, oh, wow. this is streaming live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right well people have a, the ability to go see it again that's all. yeah 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 we're what, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to take this and we're going to send it out to our uh to our email list and social media but this has been streaming live so this is going out there to the ethers well your audience uh first in the world to see some yeah. of that stuff well so. that, that, that's it and you know uh I think that this is going out uh, to ethers. This is going out to the ethers, and and uh, you know for for the best uh, you know to to the best to to the divine intention. <laughs> what can I say? All right, all right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us at this stage? I um, just want to make sure people know where they can find out more and get materials. And that's prophecyhouse.com. Okay. I do not have my social media links posted at Prophecy House, but in general, if I'm on a site, people can find me as author Tim Cohen. Run together is a single word, A-U-T-H-O-R-T-I-M-C-O-H-E-N. Um, I am on Telegram. I've got a few channels, including where I'll share, share more about uh, Mars and the moon and eventually comets and asteroids and and of course the coming war with North Korea and Iran et cetera and the subject of the Antichrist so uh, anybody wants to know more just write to Prophecy House you can get the social media links that way and of course you can check out my Facebook page which I occasionally update with updated social media links to find out more there and then Prophecy House is my publisher all my materials my books including the solar uh, solar apocalypse series will be available through there eventually. And then again, uh, I would give all this stuff away if somebody who has the means would just fund it to cover those costs, it would happen. But otherwise, Prophecy House has to charge like any other publisher to keep going and be able to do this work. And um, last thing, you know, I would love to speak at the various conventions, et cetera, where people are looking at the topic of aliens and Mars and the moon and all the rest to present some of the stuff I share with your audience today. Great. So yeah, people are listening who have the means to arrange that then get in touch. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been uh, an extraordinary. We want to uh, thank you for your, uh, for, for all your years of hard work, for your dedication, for your mission. And we look forward to uh, your your return uh, pro programs in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred. Take care. Great.